Welcome everyone to this afternoon's session on assessments in Canvas. I'm Dave Giberson. Uh, I think I, I know most of you. I know, but uh, just in case uh, there's someone there I haven't met before, uh, I'm, I was formerly an instructional design coordinator at Online Learning Pathways at the district. Um, I've been retired for about almost three years now, I guess. But um, they've asked me to come back and do a little consulting on uh, this interesting situation we find ourselves in. So um, I am delighted to see you all. And see you. we're going to be, we're going to have some fun with assessments in Canvas this afternoon. The, um, I probably will at this point go ahead and mute you just because we're kind of hitting that threshold where background noise starts to be an issue. But I have, uh, I, I've left you the capability to unmute yourself. You can either unmute yourself as I described earlier, or if you just want to talk briefly, you can use your space bar, like the push to talk button on a walkie talkie. You can just pre hold, press and hold the space bar, say what, speak your piece and then let it up again. And that will, uh, that's quicker and easier than uh, finding the mute, unmute button sometimes. And please feel free to do that. I uh, like questions as we're going along. I'd like to get them in context if I can. Can I ask something? Certainly. I'm sorry. Uh, the reason why I'm in here is I want to know if we cover how to make group assignments so that randomly one of them can be chosen for an exam, for example, so that not all students have the same. And I know you have to have some kind right. of a group assignment and I don't know how to create them. Uh, well, are we going what, to cover that? What you, uh, absolutely. What you're talking about is a question group yeah. in, uh, in a Canvas test and absolutely that is on the syllabus. <laughs> you better believe okay, it. Thank you. All right. All right, well, let me, uh, indeed, to give you an idea of what we're going to be covering, let me share my screen. Zoom superpower. And here's our outline. Uh, introduce, introduce myself. Um, oh, one of the first things I want to do in any of these sessions is show you how to get more help. How to get help yourself whenever you need it in uh, with various aspects of Canvas. And let's see, what do I do with Canvas? I know I had it up here a moment ago. Okay, let's pull it up. You have this very functional help button in the Canvas system menus on every screen in Canvas. You can always see this. If you click on that help button, you can of course call the Canvas faculty support hotline, which is a 24 seven support hotline. But right now, as you might imagine, they're a bit backed up. People have been reporting long wait times with that at certain times of the day. Your best bet is probably at off hours right now to get through to them that way. So if you have a specific question, they can handle that. They're wonderful folks, but they're in high demand right now, unfortunately. What you have available to you at any time without delay are the Canvas guides. These are terrific, numerous tutorials that Canvas posts that are in structure, the company that writes Canvas posts for you. And there are both instructor and student tutorials. So your student, if your students are having trouble with an issue in Canvas, this is a great place to point them. But under instructor guides, you there are literally hundreds of these print and static graphic tutorials in all sorts of different aspects of Canvas. And the ones that cover the topics we're going to deal with today include um, assignments, everything you could ever want to know about homework assignments in Canvas, just about. Um, quizzes. I'm looking right 
there we are quizzes not new quizzes we don't use the new quiz tool and won't for quite a while but there's just a what dozens of tutorials on quizzes different aspects of creating and using quizzes and then there are the discussions we'll talk about today the specifically ones that are graded today but there's everything you might want to know about discussions so that's always there but i will tell you what i do when i need help in canvas if somebody asks me something that i can't remember the answer to or that i've never heard of i just go to google and i type the question in like how do I um, provide unique tests? Extra character in there from somewhere. Unique tests for each student in Canvas. Random quiz question, different for each student. There it was. Um, so there's almost nothing that Google doesn't know <laughs> about Canvas. Uh, this particular one came from, uh, from the Canvas community, which is a great source. But you'll find stuff from institutions varying from uh, Fresno State to Harvard in these answers, or to Yale anyway. I know Yale uses Canvas. So that's a great way to get help with uh, Canvas as well. Yes? Dave, I was wondering with the quizzes, when you select randomized questions, and I have a student ask me to explain number six, Number six might be different from what I'm looking at. It will, at. Be. It will be. So that's my only concern with randomized questions. I think that's good uh, for uh, security's sake, I guess. Uh, but then I'm wondering how to handle that issue if I decide to go to randomized. Well, you would just have to have the student uh, give you the text of the question so you could identify which one it was. This, the, the number of the question in that case is meaningless because every student's question number six probably will be different. Right. That so they just, have to, they just have to give you the, the text of the question rather than the number. Okay, thank you. You bet. Okie dokie. So, uh, oh, and we also have available our own tutorials at there it is sdccdolvid.org we have a wide variety of zoom canvas and other educational technology tutorials here and we're adding to those all the time so if you don't find something here one time you can come back and search for it again and see if it doesn't come up like canvas testing. And there we've got a number of tutorials on that. These are video tutorials as well, where the Canvas tutorials mostly are print and static graphics, which are good, but sometimes it's easier to see something in a video. So those are available to you as well. So let's get started here uh, with our outline. Um, there are basically three types of assessments that you can use that can be uh, completed within Canvas. And those are homework assignments, graded discussions, and quizzes. We're going to look at each one, how to make them, how the students see them, and how they submit them, and then how you can grade those submissions. And then, and then we have some other details down here at the bottom that we will 
do our very best to get to. We will get to one way or the other. So that's basically our, our outline for today. And we're going to start with homework assignments. And I've got a little sandbox course here we can use to uh, illustrate some of this stuff. Homework assignments in Canvas generally require the student to perform some activity, uh, probably outside of Canvas, offline, and produce some sort of computer file, which they will then upload to Canvas to satisfy that assignment. That's the most common um, pattern for a homework assignment in Canvas anyway. the uh, a, a writing assignment would be a classic example of that. You could ask the student to write anything from a few sentences to a term paper and then submit it to a homework assignment in Canvas. Uh, the file, uh, the student would upload a file like a Word document that they had created offline uh, to the Dropbox, to a, to a Dropbox created along with the assignment. And then you would get that file, be able to view it, grade it, make comments on it, provide the grade and the comments to the student. So let's, that's certainly the best sort of assessment in an online course or when you're having to teach online because it's much more difficult to cheat on. <laughs> It's much more revealing about the student's actual mastery of the material that you've been preventing or presenting. And it's um, just a more authentic assessment, I guess, is the jargon these days. So let's talk about how to create homework assignments in, uh, in Canvas. Very simple process. You've got two places you can go to get started with that. You can go to your assignments tool here in Canvas, in the Canvas course menu. And you can click this blue button here that says add assignment. That will create an assignment in the assignments tool. And later you can link that into a module in your course. Or you can just go to your modules to start with go to the module where you want this assignment to be linked. And I'm just going to, I've made a little module here in this course that I'll just call sample assessments. This is where we'll put the examples that we make today. And to create an assignment from within a module, you just go to the add item button for the module, the plus sign on the same line as the name of the module and select from the drop down menu add assignment. We're going to create a new assignment here. If I had the assignment already created, for instance, if I created it under the assignments tool, I would see it listed here. But I'm going to make a new one here. Add that item. Oop. <laughs> and I, the only thing I have to do at this point, in addition to selecting new assignment, is to give it a name. I'll call it sample assignment and add the item. Well, we get a link for that assignment, but we know right now it's, it's empty. It's, it's, uh, there's no assignment there. It's just a shell of an assignment to actually put, uh, to make this something usable. I have to click on the name of the assignment and edit it using the very prominently featured edit button here. Love the Canvas interface. It's very intuitive in most cases. So here's the name of our assignment. I'll just leave that. I can always edit that later if I like. The first thing I'd want to do is provide instructions to the students on what I want them to do in order to satisfy this assignment. What's it about? What do you have to do? How are you going to do it? And so on. Well, let's say um, 
this course that we're working in here was based on an old flex course that I used to offer online uh, on the technique of the multimedia technique of screencasting. So something I might put into this course would be a, uh, an assignment asking them to define screencasting and maybe give them a little bit more information, include um, applications for screencasting uh, and some tools that can be used to create screencasts. So I'm asking them for a fairly extended definition. It's not something they're going to be able to do satisfactorily in a single sentence. So they're going to have to spend some time thinking about this. All right. so. I give them the instructions on what I want them to do. And the instructions can be much more robust than this. You can include uh, images. You've got the full rich content editor here. So you can include images. You can embed media like video. You can create links to external resources that you need them to go take a look at before they can actually perform the assignment and so on. And once you get that done, it's the rest of the setting up the assignment is really pretty uh, quick and easy. First thing you have to do is specify the number of points you want the assignment to uh, be worth. That will depend on your own weighting scheme and how you weight how, how important this assignment is to your overall grade. If you are weighting your grades by assignment group or category, like tests, quizzes, homework assignments, graded discussions, each having a different weight, it matters which assignment group you put this in. I have three, and this would clearly be an assignment, not a test, so I select that one, but this may not matter. If you're weighting your grades by the number of points that you assign to each assessment, then this doesn't matter. Uh, display grade as usually points, though you can also display it by percentage or GPA 4.0 to zero scale, or even by letter grade if you prefer, assuming you've set up letter grade cutoffs in your uh, course. There is an option if this is just a practice assignment to avoid having it count toward the final grade. You might put a practice assignment in your course so that your students could practice submitting files to it to see if they're likely to have any trouble down the line when, it, when the, their grade is actually at stake. But usually, obviously, that won't be checked. <laughs> it wouldn't be much point giving them an assignment if it wasn't going to count toward their grade. Probably the single most important of these options is the submission type. How are the students going to turn this in? And your options are no submission. That's if you're creating a blank column in your grade book. Uh, this way rather than for something that was done earlier or is handed in in class or whatever you don't want them to uh, uh, they're not actually going to uh, satisfy this assignment online through canvas or on paper is basically the same thing but in our situation right now the uh, the submission type is almost certainly going to be online because we're not seeing our students there's no physical contact, so they can't really turn it in. I guess I could mail it to you, email it, or snail mail it to you, but um, much more likely that this is going to be an online assignment. And when you select online, you get some options for how the students can submit this online. 
And there are only two that really make a lot of a lot of sense here for our current situation. One is text entry. If you check that option, when the student goes to submit the assignment, they'll be presented with a text box, actually a rich content editor window, just like you had up here in creating the assignment instructions, they'll get this same editor. And they can actually type in their uh, submission for the assignment online in Canvas uh, right then and there, rather than preparing the their answers beforehand. That's okay for relatively short um, submissions where they're only going to type maybe a few sentences, a paragraph or something like that. That's not a big deal. I certainly wouldn't make that an option for say a term paper. Uh, it's not practical for them to sit there and, and type a term paper out while the uh, uh, while the assignment is open, as it were, and they're actually submitting it. But it might be useful in, in many circumstances. The other major option is file upload, where the student will create a file offline that they will later upload to Canvas to, to satisfy this assignment. It might be a writing assignment, it might be a picture that they've drawn, it might be an AutoCAD drawing. It could be any sort of computer file that you've specified them to do. Uh, you might have them create an Excel spreadsheet, for instance, that satisfied certain criteria, and then upload that Excel file so you could then download it and, and open it up in Excel. But probably more often than not, this means a writing assignment, like a, a, a term paper or a much shorter paragraph on some topic that you wanted them to. Uh, does that research. allow them to do a Word document? I'm sorry now? Does that allow for a Word document? Absolutely. That would certainly be the most single most common type of file they might upload. But they might upload a lot of different things <laughs> too. There are some, uh, there's quite a variety of tools that the students might have available to them, depending on the type of computer or device that they're using and so on. And some of those file types might be things that you'd have trouble opening up. So it's possible to restrict the type of files that they can upload here. You can certainly put in your directions, in your instructions for the assignment, I want this as a Word document but you might not get it that way, <laughs> even if you insist on it. Seen that way too many times. And you might get a file, if you're, say you're working on a Windows PC, you might get a pages document from, uh, from a Mac. And you might not have any way to open that. Is it um, possible to embed a fillable table in that rich content text box? To embed a what? Uh, a table that the student can fill in, like empty table they can put the data in it. Is it possible no. to put that in the text box? Not in the instruction box, no. That's just displayed to them. They don't have any means of editing or adding to them. Oh, okay. But okay. that said, you could, um, you could attach, let's say, no, you can, uh, yes. You could attach a file to this. Mm -hmm by going to the files tab here in the rich content editor. And you could attach a word document to it. Mm -hmm. And then they could download that, fill it out, and then upload that word document as the uh, fulfillment for this assignment. And that would work like a charm. Okay, thank you. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Great. Yeah, you always have the ability to uh, attach files to this as well. I should have mentioned that. So thanks for the question. <laughs> like I say, it keeps me uh, keeps me honest. But you can restrict file upload file types. 
And you do that by entering a list of accept, uh, accepted file extensions. Like, here's a, here's a possibility. Dot .doc is the file extension for the old type of Word documents. And you can put multiples here by putting a comma in between them. Or docx is the more modern dot docx is the more modern Word doc file type. You can ensure then that the students cannot successfully upload anything else. So uh, you can control that quite nicely. If you forget to do that and you get something that you can't open, you can always check with us and see if we don't have something that we'll be able to open. Um, we've got a, a couple of Chris and Trenton at Online Learning Pathways are both Mac folks. So if somebody <laughs> uploads a file to you that you can't open on a PC and it's something came off a Mac, chances are they can help with that. We're always happy to do that. But it's easier for you if you just ensure that the files that you get will work for you. Um, if this is a writing assignment or has a significant amount of writing in it, you can also request plagiarism review, automatic plagiarism review through our plagiarism checker, Unicheck. Uh, and um, you can make this a if you're if you have student groups set up in your course you can make this a group assignment in which uh, or in fulfillment of which a group of students will work on it together and submit it once and all the whole group gets the same grade that's the way group assignments generally work though there is an option if you make this a group assignment to um and I can't show you that directly because I don't have groups set up in this course, but there is an option, yeah, to assign grades to each student individually if you set up a group assignment. We have a, a, a session on just using student groups in Canvas, and we have that recorded and available online, again, at our sdccdolvid.org, uh, our on-demand video site here as well. I'll just mention that as an aside. You can require peer review, and you can either assign other students to manual, uh, manually to uh, review each other's work and provide feedback. They can't actually grade, but they can provide feedback. Or you can have peer reviews automatically assigned and decide how many peer reviews per student you want to require. So this is another way to get students involved with each other. It can be a little uncomfortable for them, but it's a highly instructive process. Uh, and you can even have those peer reviews be anonymous, if you wish, to uh, limit the embarrassment that some students might feel commenting on their uh, peers' work. So if you use, um, whoops, sorry. Go for it. Okay. So if you use. Uh oh, uh, we just lost you. I'm sorry. On peer review. Ah, there we are. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> It said I was on, but it was lying. <laughs> okay, so um, on peer review, do students just jump in there and pick what they want to review, or how does that work? You can assign it, or you, they will be assigned specific uh, uh, other students' work to uh, review. And uh, you can either do that manually, or you can have Canvas do it on just randomly. Oh, okay. They will be assigned specific uh, tasks to do, and depend. And the the number they'll have to do is set right here, so they won't have to do. No one student will have to do more than that number. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, by default, the assignment would be assigned to everyone. Uh, and we'll see why you might not do that here in a second. Uh, you can assign due dates. That's a good idea for you to do that because uh, in that, and when you assign a due date, the due date appears in the student's calendar automatically. So it's another reminder to them to what their uh, responsibilities are. And you can set also set available from and until dates. Uh, the student can't submit the assignment before the available from date and can't submit it after the available until date. Usually the available until date is the same as the due date, but not always. There are circumstances where those might not be the same. So you can control student, the time period over which students can access this. And from time to time, of course, that it'll be necessary for students to, some students to be given access outside of these time limitations. Uh, someone, God forbid, has gone into the hospital and needs to be able to submit it late. Uh, they other and with this display until date here, they're not going to be able to do that unless you give them an exception to that. And you can do that for an individual student by clicking an, this little add button down here at the bottom, which is otherwise rather cryptic. And you can pick the student who needs the accommodation and you can give them a different due date and uh, available until date than everyone else. So this, this student then has until May the 9th to turn it in or May, oops, May 8th, it's due, May 9th is the <laughs> last moment, uh, rather than everyone else having to turn it in by April 30th. You can do this with, this is the same way you do this with quizzes as well. So you can give individual students different availability ranges vis-a-vis -vis date and time using okay. that technique. Yes. On the, hi, on the addition to this, there is a place that says course, and I'm, if I have two courses of the same type and I want them both to hand in this assignment, I thought, well, can't I just put that course in there? But evidently you can't, right? No, no, you have to have the same assignment in two different courses okay. and grade them separately. Yeah. So why does it say course when it says assigned the addition one? Right. This well, here it says sec course section. Yeah. And there we get into a, uh, a uh, conflict between how Canvas uses the word section oh, okay. and how the district uses the word section. Within a Canvas course, a Canvas shell, you can create virtual sections. Oh. And you can assort your students between them yourself and so that you, they have separate discussion forums and things like that and so on, if you okay. have too many people in the shell. But that's not compatible with our automatic student population process. So for in each course section in, Can in Campus Solutions and PeopleSoft has a separate course shell in Canvas. Right. And we don't use this virtual section functionality in Canvas at all. And I agree, it is confusing. What that and, drove and us that all just, nuts when we first got Canvas to play with. That's that shows why it's good to come to these workshops more than once because I've heard you say this before. <laughs> now that well, you say it, it, again. it is that is a confusing terminology. You're absolutely right, and there are a couple of instances of that, of that in Canvas, and this is one of them. Okay. Good question. All right, so we have our assignment pretty much set up. That's really all we have to do at this point. We just save it, or better yet, save it and publish it so that it's 
available to students, at least as soon as the available from date is passed, if I set that. So I save and publish, and we see the big green button. It's hard to, hard to miss whether an assignment is available to students or not. It used to be very easy to miss that in Blackboard. In Canvas, it's very hard because of that big green button there. And if I go back to the module where I originally uh, uh, created this thing, there it is. Sample assignment, and it even warns us there are multiple due dates depending on who you are. Kind of cool. Uh, and this is published, so it's available to students. You'll note the module itself was not published. So if I want the students to be able to see this, I have to publish the module as well. Uh, have to be green circles with white check marks all up and down the module in order for the students to get into this. So we know what this looks like. Hard way. Yes, go right ahead. <laughs> I said I learned that the hard way. <laughs> yeah, did I too? <laughs> but at least it's easier to see immediately how you messed up in Canvas right. <laughs> as right. opposed to Blackboard. Um, get it fixed quicker. So. This is what you see when you create an assignment, or what do the students see? You can always tell, and it's always a good idea to check, by going to your home link on your course menu and going into your student view. This is what the students see. And there was, obviously, there were things, uh, if I hadn't checked those, if I hadn't done that publishing, the students wouldn't see this sample assignment at all. The, when you go into student view, it's more than just a different look to the course for you. You are in fact logged out as the instructor and logged in automatically as a test student, a test student that's automatically provided with the shell when you get it. So you're actually operating as a quote, actual unquote student here. You can do anything in student view that a real student could do, including submitting assignments, taking quizzes, participating in discussions, just about everything. Hmm. Um, so, and your attempts will go into the grade book. So you can check out the full student experience this way. So let's see how that works. Well, a student who is ready to look at this assignment would go to the sample assignment link here in the module, and they would get some information about the assignment, how it's gonna be submitted, what file types they have to be able to uh, create, and by the way, students, virtually any word processor these days, including the Apple ones, has the capability of saving a file as a Word document, even if that's not its native file format, like OpenOffice's writer will save a, a Word doc, even though it's not actually Microsoft Word. And that's true for most word processors these days. So a student should be able to create a Word document, no matter what they're creating the thing on, what device or what piece of software they're using. And they get some availability information and when it's due and the number of points it's worth. And they see the instructions for the assignment. So at this point, they can read that, think about it, jot it down and go and proceed to create a, uh, a document offline, if they wish, that will satisfy this assignment. And when they get done doing that, they can come right back to where they are here and click Submit Assignment. That doesn't mean they're actually uploading the file right this instant. It means what they're, they're getting to the page where they can do that. So they can click Submit Assignment at any time. And if you recall, I checked options both for file upload and for text entry. Um, just to show you what both look like. 
and indeed you can you can give them both but we'll see there is a good reading reason that we'll see here in a minute when we talk about how we're going to grade this there's a good reason why you might want them to do the file upload rather than text entry uh, and the file upload specifically as a word document or a pdf or a uh, an open office document because uh, there are things you can do in grading feedback that you with if you have a word document to work with that you can't do if the students just type it in in a, in a text box but here's their file upload Dropbox, if you will, their interface that will allow them to upload a file. If they click on the text entry tab, they'll just see a rich content editor window, a Canvas a text editor window, and they can just type their type or paste their uh, their submission right in there. Or if they use Google Docs, they can go to their Google Drive. And this is something I can't show you as the test or as the uh, the test student because the test student doesn't have a Google account. But this this would just bring up all of the documents that they have stored on Google Drive, and they could select the one they wanted to submit and submit it that way rather than having to download the Google Doc onto their local computer and then upload it back up to Canvas. It gives them a a, a, a more streamlined. Interaction with Google Drive if they're if they're using Google Docs as their word processor, and that they get automatically if you give them the file upload option, they get this Google Drive option automatically because we've activated that at the system level. Okay, and at this point the process is pretty pretty simple. They just choose the file that has their homework assignment in it. And they got a, a Windows Explorer window or a Finder window on the Mac, and they look for that file. I think I've got mine in, in here, yep. And here I've got a screencasting definition that I typed out in advance. It's in a Word document, so that should be acceptable to the uh, to Canvas. So I click open. At this point, if that weren't a Word doc, they'd get an error and they'd have to back out and do something about that. And they can upload a number of files uh, if that's necessary. If you, if the assignment, if it was an assignment in many parts and you had several different things you asked them to do in this one assignment, they can upload more than one file at a time to uh, satisfy the assignment. But once they've picked the right file, all they have to do is click the uh, Submit Assignment button again, and the file is uploaded to a Dropbox area in um, Canvas that only you and this student have access to. They get a, a receipt that they can take a screenshot of or something, or they can come back and pull this up later, that specifies uh, exactly when they submitted the assignment, in case there's ever any question. You'll have that information too, though. They can uh, look at the details. They can download the file. If later on they realize they've lost that file somehow, they can download it again if they want, keep it. And, they can resubmit the assignment as long as they're within that uh, uh, display after and display until window they can resubmit the assignment and there's nothing you can do to stop them from doing that students can submit canvas homework assignments multiple times and you can't prevent that you can decide which one you're going to grade but you can't prevent them from submitting multiples. Uh, something more than one request to Canvas has been based on, but they, they, they seem to feel like they want to keep it this way, so. Does the multiple submission uh, overrides the previous one? I mean, the no, second. No, you, you, you'll have them all. Oh. 
you'll have access to all of them and you get to pick the one. My advice would be to just tell your students that you're gonna grade the first thing they put in unless they contact you and, and have a good reason otherwise. Like, oh my God, I, I submitted the wrong file by accident. Then, okay, you know, but given uh, infinite tries is probably not pointless. Yes. <laughs> I thought you can uh, say if uh, you allow multiple um, submissions and you can say that, no. You that's, an, that's in a quiz. Oh, with the quiz, you can control the number of times they can take it. Oh. With the homework assignment, you can't control the number of times they submit. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, that that was a bit of a surprise to me the first time I saw that too. <laughs> it took me a while before I really believed it. I had to try it out. All right, so the students submitted the assignment. And they're done. So they move on to the next one and the next one. For you. Now I'm gonna leave student view and become me again. If I don't reset the student, that submission will remain in there. And that's what I'm gonna do right now because I'm gonna use that one as an example to show you how to grade it. So we'll leave student view. And Canvas will get back to us. Now I'm me again instead of the test student. And I can go to my grade book and look for that assign or look for that submission. That was a uh, an assignment I labeled sample assignment. Here it is, way out here at the end. New assignments are generally put on the right hand edge of the grade book. So I'll run that back over here just for convenience. Nice thing I can do in the grade book in Canvas. <laughs> and here's. Uh, an indication that my test student who has their own line in the grade book has submitted a uh, response or a, an attempt for this sample assignment. If I forget what the sample assignment was, <laughs> this hair didn't come out of a bottle, you know, um, I can go back and see <laughs> what it was. And I can see the submissions here. or I rather I can see the due dates and so on, excuse me. So now let me go back to the grade book, find that assignment again. And there it is. So how do I grade this? Well, I could just manually put in a number. <laughs> I know this student's no good. <laughs> Slap a zero in. No, 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 we're not gonna do that. We're gonna go to the speed grader, the grading interface in Canvas. We do that by clicking on this little right arrow here in the gradebook cell. And I have some status information on the uh, assignment, like if it's late or excused, if the student didn't have to turn in this assignment for some reason. Um, and I also have a link to the speed grader, to the grading interface. In Canvas. You'll see a display of the student's submission here. <clears throat> You'll also see a place to enter a grade, obviously. You'll see a place if you want to keep a copy of this on your local machine, or if it's a file type that you can't really grade within Canvas, you can download it here. If this were like an AutoCAD drawing, you just get a little placeholder symbol over in this uh, uh, area here, the canvas wouldn't be able to open that file up. But you can download the file and open it up on your local computer and grade it and then come back here and provide a, a numeric grade out of 10 in this case. But you're not, by the way, you're not limited by that number right there. You can put any number here. If you felt the student deserved extra credit, you can give them a 12. And Canvas will accept it. I've done that from time to time. Um, you can also make comments about the uh, assignment in general and in other ways that I'll go into in a moment here. But let's first look at the uh, display of this, this document that 
this test student uploaded. Um, if this student uploaded a Word document, which they did, a PDF, a open office document or one of a couple other types. I'll have these little tools here, these markup tools available to me in the speed grader. And I can provide very precisely targeted feedback here. Like um, I can give highlight annotation. If I highlight a word or phrase in the document. Canvas provides me with a little text box where I can leave a targeted comment specifically about those words. Or, you know, what, whatever's good. Whatever is uh, appropriate. I can even highlight entire paragraphs. Whatever. I've also got uh, point annotations where I can put a comment right in a particular spot between two words, but strike out information. And do an annotation there so I can strike out a word and replace it with something suggest with a suggestion to them and other options there there's a variety of possibilities there we go into that in great detail in our grading uh, seminar but this gives you an idea of the type of annotations markup annotations they're called which you can make so you can give some very precise feedback it's like your blue pencil if you had if the student were sitting there or if you had the piece of paper in front of you and your blue pencil and you were marking it up and then you're going to hand that paper back to the student this is the online digital equivalent of that. And you can be quite specific in your feedback. You can also provide uh, very specific or general comments about it. Hopefully something a little bit more detailed than nice job. <laughs> you can upload a file if you wish uh, to with very specific feedback in it if you like downloaded their word document and marked it up on some uh, local uh, with some local markup tool you can then upload it back to this with those changes in it or you could you could create a screencast a video a screen video of you going through the the uh, document and talking about specific parts of it, which would be tantamount to the student being able to sit there with you while you uh, graded their document. And they get not only the, your grades and your uh, comments uh, or brief comments, but they, they understand your entire thought about the why you gave them a grade they did and what they could do to do better next time and so on. Very, very powerful possibility. You can even give them a quick uh, talking head video right from within Canvas. If you have a webcam, let me select the right webcam here. It's hard to do this when you're in a Zoom session because Zoom locks down your main webcam, but I have, I have another one on this machine I can use for this. You make sure Canvas can hear you. Uh, you may have to change microphones. 
uh, or select a microphone that's actually working. So you do need a webcam and a microphone to do this. Then you just start your recording. Fairly well done. Faint praise. Uh, you can play that back to make sure it's okay. Fairly well done. And then save it and it becomes a part of the permanent grading record. The student can see that video. They can pull that up in their own grading interface and see it. And it's very easy for them to, to see. It's prominently featured for them. Steve, I'm sorry, where Are did you access that feature? I'm sorry now? I'm sorry, where did you access that feature? Just to the left, right? Uh, yeah, it's right under the add a comment box. It's this little icon right here. It looks Got like it. a little screen with a right carrot in it. You'll Got see it. that Thank other you. places in Canvas too, where you can embed these videos. And it's a, a caveat, it's very difficult to get these captioned. So in this case, you'd be providing feedback to an individual student whose status presumably is hearing impaired or not, you would know. So it's okay for this not to be captioned in this case, as long as the student is not hearing impaired. If the student's hearing impaired, then you wouldn't, it wouldn't be appropriate to use this tool here. Or you would have to go through the hoops necessary to get it captioned, which I'm not gonna cover right now. <laughs> but my personal favorite, if you're using the Chrome web browser, is this little icon, the little speaker icon, Not bad. I'd like to see a little more detail on applications, but good work. And it converts your speech to text and provides it to the student when you submit that. You have an option to edit that if need be, and then you can submit it. And all this becomes a part of the permanent record, if you were, well, for the this particular assignment submission. And it takes a lot less time to do this than it does to talk about it. So you can, you can grade one assignment after another after another very quickly using this tool. And when you finish with one student, rather than having to go back to the grade book and look for another submission, you can just jump from student to student to student by just clicking the right arrow here in the upper right hand corner until you get back to the original one. So if you have a whole column full of submissions, you can go through them very efficiently without having to keep hopping back to the main gradebook display. So this uh, grading interface is really quite excellent. So Dave, I have a question about this. Um, yes. Actually, I was asking my students today how much of that, I mean, where do they see that? Because I'm putting the effort into doing all that commenting. Mm -hmm. Do right. they have to go back to the assignment and open it up? How do they, how do they know, number oh. one, that I put comments? Well, uh, they won't know. Uh, they're not notified. Well, I'll take that back. There is a notification that they can select that will tell them when an assignment has been graded. Uh, that you don't have any control over though. They have to pick oh, that. Oh, they have to do that. They have to pick that. But yeah, it, let's go back to uh, our home screen again and so go Dave, in as our test student. Mm -hmm. Dave, in the, um, when you're on the, where the grades are shown there, if they uh, turn something in late and it shows up pink on my screen, do they see it right. that way also? Well, they, it, it is, when they submit the assignment, if you allow a late submission, which means that you set the display until date past the due date, uh, then they will be notified that it's late when they turn it in. Okay, thank you. You bet. So uh, let me go, let me become my test student again and show you what they see. Here's their grades tool, which is, and ah, notice that it is notifying them here that they have a new grade. So they do get that notice. 
forgot about that one. All right, and this was the, uh, let's see, sample assignment. There it is. And I got a little note here that they have a, they have a grade for that. They can see the grade. Um, they can see uh, comments right under this. And there's that video comment. And here's the text comment that I put in there. They can, if they go and check or click on the actual name of the assignment there, they'll see their comments here. They'll see the document that they uploaded. They can attach a file and they can resubmit the assignment from here as well. So that's what it looks like to the students when they get that feedback from you. So did, did you give that student 12 points that 10 showed? I did, I did, I did not. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, said, I said I could, <laughs> but okay. I didn't. So if they click on that screencasting definition, is that where they see the in-text comments? No, this would just download the file that they submitted to them. Where do they know they're- Oh, oh wait a minute, wait, oh, 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 the, right, 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 right. Sorry. Let's see, they should, view feedback, there we go, sorry, my bad. This would just download the file for them. Okay. Here's the feedback that you put in. Okay, so they go to view feedback. View feedback to see the markup feedback, right? Okay. I was about to forget that. Thank you. Okay. So they can see everything that you did in grading that, that you chose to leave for them. All right. Okay. So very rich grading interaction there. It's uh more than you could do for each individual student in a face-to-face -face class because you just wouldn't have the time you'd be you'd be sitting there for hours going through each student's paper with them here you can give very rich feedback to everyone in a very time effective manner and they can view it on their own time and in my case they can read it <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah that's for me too <laughs> i get a little little uh, uh, wild with that blue pencil sometimes, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Excellent. All right, so that's, that's a pretty good look at homework assignments, which again are the, probably the best type of assessment in, a, uh, in an online or temporarily online class because it just tells you so much more about the, what the student knows and it's very difficult for them to game you can usually tell if it's not their work very quickly. Uh, not as not so much with an objective test, but we'll look at those too. Before we look at the test, which I'll spend most of the rest of the time on, very quickly, you can also set up discussion forms, which are gradable. Uh, you do that when you create the discussion by selecting the option to make it graded. And that's all that and providing a number of points is all you have to do to make a discussion graded. So and more and we do more with discussions in our uh, session on communication in Canvas. I think most of you are probably fairly familiar with discussion forms. Just to be on the safe side, let me show you what a short discussion forum might look like. Here's one that I set up and I had some test students reply to. You provide a set of instructions or a question or something that starts the discussion and then the students reply. Like this student replied to my instructions here. And then all the other students and I can see it. Another student comes in and has a question about this student's submission. I know that this 
is a reply to that because it's indented underneath it. And, and they're, they're presented right together with some uh, white space in between the discussion threads so that I know that these three posts are related. This post is a reply to that one. And this post is a reply to this reply. And you can have these threads of discussion, which make it possible for you to follow a discussion that doesn't take place in real time, where people are, are posting at different times. The discussion tool groups those related posts together and shows you how they're related to one another. So here's a number of posts by two or three different students. How does that get graded? Or what's that look like when you grade it? Well, if we go to the grade book and find that discussion, there it is. Looks like I've graded two of those students, but not the third one. I grade it using the speed grader, just as I did before. Go to the speed grader. And I get, for that student, I get every post that the student made in this discussion forum, this particular discussion topic. And I can just look at them and provide a grade. Or I can go back and view the full discussion as I was looking at it a moment ago and see this in context, if I need to, in order to assign the grade. And I can assign comments, just as I did with the uh, homework assignment and then submit the grade to the grade book and it'll be there. So that's grading. This makes grading discussion forum participation very quick and easy as opposed to having to search through the forum itself and find posts by each individual student. That would take forever. So the grading tools pulls out all the posts by a particular student and allows you to very quickly uh, assign a value or a grade value to them. Dave, can you show me the speed grader again in the grade book? Uh, yes, the speed grader is uh, for discussion. It's accessed the same way no matter what type of assessment. You just click on the assessment, either the grade or the little symbol if it hasn't been graded. Click the right arrow in the cell that pops up when you click into the cell. And then the speed grader is in this panel that pops out. Oh, okay. Thanks. And there's the link to it. And that will bring up that assignment. This is a quiz. We'll see that again in a minute, how, how you can grade this is how you would see your students test papers quote unquote papers and also how you would grade um, subjective questions essay questions for instance Alrighty, let's go back and the third type of assessment we want to talk about is a quiz a test. Canvas uses the word quiz to refer to anything from a two question pop quiz to a final exam. They're all quizzes to Canvas. And there's not much that you can test on paper in a classroom that you can't test on Canvas. There are, the Canvas testing engine is quite sophisticated and you can ask almost any type of question you could ask on a paper test in class. The, to create a quiz, which is the first thing we'll talk about, you have two options, just as you did with homework assignments. You can go to the quizzes tool, which automatically lists all of the quizzes that you have in the course. And you can create the new quiz by clicking on the add quiz button in the upper right hand corner. But I like to create them in the modules. You can do that as well. 
here in my sample assessments module, I can add a quiz. Again, could be a final exam to Canvas, it's a quiz. And I'll click new quiz. If I'd already made the quiz, I could select it here and make a link to it, but I'm gonna make a new quiz to show you how to do it. And we'll give that quiz the name of, how about sample quiz? And add the item. Again, this is a blank quiz. It's, there's nothing there yet. So to actually flesh it out, I have to click on the name of the quiz and edit it. Very comparable to the homework assignment we did earlier. But in a quiz, I have two tabs here, two screens that I need to deal with, the, the details tab and the questions tab. Obviously, the questions tab is where I add questions to the test. The details tab is where I set test options. Let's see what those look like, what those options are. Well, first off, I have a place to answer or to provide instructions, the, the stuff you'd have typed at the top of the paper on an on a actual test paper, like answer the questions. Name. Hopefully where something a little more detailed. Yes. Where's the button you say add options? I didn't see that. You said add options when you're doing no, the sample. These, these are test options in the details tab. That's how where, we used to refer to them. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's in the details tab. Okay. Details tab has your test options in it, right? Okay, thank you. You bet. So hopefully your instructions will be a little more detailed than that. Like maybe answer all the questions. Uh, Canvas doesn't really have a way to penalize students for guessing. <laughs> Blackboard used to. <laughs> Canvas doesn't. Take a particularly nasty person to do that. Yes, there are reasons for doing that. But anyway, Canvas doesn't give you that option. Okay, so what are the test options you can pick? Well, first off, uh, you can tell Canvas whether this is an actual, real, graded quiz or just a practice quiz. Practice quizzes are nice study tools. You can provide a practice quiz to students, if nothing else, at the beginning of the term, to uh, familiarize them with the process of taking a test in Canvas so that they're, they're not confronting that the first time, you know, in a high stakes situation, the first time they try to, um, to submit a test in Canvas. Or practice quizzes, of course, can be great study aids. So you can make those, and those, of course, don't go into the grade book and they don't affect the student's grade, but they do give them a chance to practice. You can also do surveys through the quizzing tool in Canvas. And I have no idea what a graded survey might be. <laughs> Never, I don't know where they came up with that option. Normally surveys are ungraded. You're just trying to collect information. Though maybe you give them some credit for actually responding, I guess. Don't know. So usually, though, though of course, this will be a graded quiz. There's that assignment group again. This is a quiz. so. Since I have three assignment groups, I'm gonna put this in the test assignment group. That only really matters if you are weighting your grades, your grade computation by assignment group rather than by individual assessments. And if you have more questions about that, I'll take them later. Now we have more options. The first one is one I strongly recommend against checking, shuffle answers. This means on multiple choice and multiple answer type questions, the presentation of the answers will be um, random. And the theory is that this increases test security because the student can't call another one up and say, what's the answer to question five? And the other student says, C, <laughs> you know, the third answer. And it'd be different on the two. That's not likely to really make much difference. And what shuffle answers will do is totally destroy questions that have like the last answer is all of the above. 
<laughs> if all of the above comes at the top, it's not going to make a lot of sense. So I don't recommend checking that one. I don't think it adds much to test security and it can sure cause chaos. Um, you can set a time limit, of course, of however much you, however many minutes you wish. This is a critical security tool. Now, obviously, online ob quizzes, objective tests, or even subjective tests like this, uh, do suffer from a, uh, a security issue. Uh, if you give too much time on a test, a student can just go to Google and look up all the answers. Or they can call their friends and ask them, well, what's the answer to the question that says da 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 da? If you set, a t say you, it's a multiple choice test, and you set the time limit to about a minute a question, they can't do that effectively. If they try to do it, they'll, they won't get done. They'll leave so many questions blank that they'll, they'll fail in the, uh, in the attempt. So that's a critical security parameter to set a time limit and to make it tight enough that the student has enough time to think about the question and answer it if they know the answer, but they don't have enough time to, to look it up, which you can't really stop them from trying. Uh, allow multiple attempts where appropriate is an option. That's your decision, of course. If you do allow multiple attempts, you can decide which score to keep, either the highest, the last, or an average of all the attempts. And you can specify the number of attempts uh, if you wish. If you don't specify a number of allowed attempts, they can take it as, as many times as they like. This would be more uh, appropriate for maybe a low, very low stakes quiz, like a syllabus quiz or something like that, where you want them to just keep keep doing it until I get them all right. <laughs> you're, you're just interested in them getting the knowledge and not really evaluating their performance. But you can provide multiple attempts at, if you desire. And you can enforce that here. Otherwise, the student can only take the test once by default, unlike the homework assignment where they can resubmit all week if they want. This next section has to do with feedback. What the student sees, what, what the feedback the student gets on this test is, and when they see it. If this, if you uncheck that, the students get no feedback initially. And you can provide that to them later. But you can check that and control what they see. Uh, the default setting is to let the students see their quiz responses with the incorrect questions marked, the ones they missed marked, but no correct answers. So they can't call up their friends and say, oh, I, the, <laughs> I thought the answer to this question was so-and-so, but it's actually this. They can't do that in that event. If you check this, the student will see the feedback immediately. You can't delay that. You can fix it so the student only sees this once, right after they submit the test, or after each submission, if it's multiple attempts allowed. So they get a look at it once, but then they can't look back at it again. But that would prevent them from seeing from going back and studying their test paper later. So that's of limited use, I think. If you want the students to also be able to see the correct answers for the questions they missed, you can check that box, but <laughs> you can set that to only after their last attempt, after they've exhausted all their attempts, so they can't just take it multiple times and <laughs> the, the, uh, the problem there is obvious. Or you can set the date and time period over which they can actually view those correct answers if you decide to allow them to see the correct answers. 
So you have a fair bit of flexibility in determining when or what the students can see and when they can see it. They will be able, in, unless you uncheck this, they will be able to go back later and look in their grades tool and see their test paper and see what you've allowed them to see. Can I ask a question real quick? Of course. Um, uh, for an exam, what would you recommend? Um, I'm unsure about this. So obviously no multiple attempts, but if students Probably see, not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it, so if students see their quiz responses, the incorrect questions will be marked. And if I don't click mm -hmm. only once after each attempt, then they could go back to the question and try many times? Uh, no, they can't try many times if you haven't allowed multiple attempts. This oh. is, they'll see this only after they submit the test. Okay, so uh, attempt, when it says attempt, it not talks about the attempt for the question, it talks about, or does it? The, or does it attempt, talk about the, the attempt entire, of the whole submission? The whole submission, the whole quiz. The whole, yes. okay. So, so they don't, they won't see any feedback until they submit the test. Okay, one more time. I'm not sure if I get it. So let students see their quiz response. Incorrect questions will be marked. Is that mm -hmm. okay or not okay for an exam? Well, it just depends on your the, the type of quiz it is. For um, a final exam, that would probably not be appropriate. For a, for a, a, like a weekly quiz or daily quiz or something, it might well be because those are more learning experiences than assessments. Right, but so for exam, being a high stake assessment, I might not, uh, and, it's, and it's the last time they're gonna take a test, I probably wouldn't give that to them right away. Okay, so they cannot see the response unless the whole thing is submitted and then they can see it one time and that's it, correct? Uh, so if, if, you, if you select the appropriate options, right. So only after each attempt, that would mm -hmm. be the attempt, the whole submission of the exam, right? Then they can right. see it one time. If you check only once after each attempt, yes. Okay. And if I only Otherwise, give they can see it as many, they can go into their grades tool and see it whenever they like, if you don't check this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that should not be the case because then they can tell other people, I guess. Well, there you have to balance the, that worry against the value of the test, the going back and looking at the test when the student is, say, preparing for their final exam. I, I always wanted to go back and look at my previous tests and see what I'd had trouble with and make sure I studied carefully on those areas. Mm -hmm. And that's a, legitimate, that's a legitimate value to the student to do that. So you have to balance those interests. And you're, you're the only one who would know in your course uh, uh, just exactly how valuable that would be and what, how to balance those interests. So that, that comes down to a value judgment on your part. And if I wanted them to be able to see it uh, multiple times but not doing the exam, then I would click what? Uh, not, they'll never see feedback during the exam, ever. Oh. But but if you if you check this box they and do not check only once after each attempt, they will be able to go back and go to their grades tool and see how they did. Okay, but not doing the exam. But not never during the exam. Oh, okay. So let's stu see students see their quiz responses. Incorrect questions only would be this first one that is checked right now, correct? Right. Okay, thank you. That's the minimum level of feedback you can give them. Uncheck that and they'll never see anything. Yeah. Can they'll never see anything. So once the exam is over, the they can still go back and see the entire exam when you go to grade, grade book? Is it possible? They can. That? Yeah. Oh. If you check if you check this box, they can, yes. Oh. No, I, I don't want them to do that because then they can copy the exam and take pictures of the exam and sell them to students next semester, unless I they want to make a new that. exam every semester. Yeah, well, I will tell you that there's really no, because they could do that while they were taking it. 
very quickly. And um, I have a perspective on this. When I started out as a young faculty member back in the, way back in the 20th century, I taught at a, um, a residential women's college with sororities. And the sororities kept files of tests on every professor on campus. So I knew <laughs> that my, that all of my tests were out and I knew I'd have to make a new test every time. It got to the point where I, I felt that it was unfair for the sorority sisters to have this resource and the students who were not in sororities not to have it. So I got to the point where I would run off my previous semester's tests for each section of my course and give them out in class as students were preparing to study for the next for the test that semester so that everybody was you know in a had a level playing field mm. so yeah you're if this test when this test goes online it's it's no longer secure there are too many ways the students can make a screenshot of it or take a picture of it with their cell phone there's just no way to stop that so the test goes online, you're going to have to make a new test next time. Do you recommend, Here. by the way, to have students only see one question at a time for that reason? That is another security option, yes. And that prevents them from going back and, try and rethinking their answer to that question, which usually <laughs> keeps them from uh, changing the right answer to a wrong one. But um, I don't know that that's quite restrictive it means yeah. a student can't can't go through and um, let's say you know we all know how often the the answer to a question lower down than the test will will cause us to remember the answer for one up above mm -hmm. and you take that option away from them if you display the questions one at a time it does make the test more secure that's true but at a at a fairly heavy price. Mm -hmm. Students hate that. Yeah, I heard that, that stresses the student it. out a lot. Yeah, yeah, because also then normally on a paper test, they could skip that and come back later if they can't think of it right now. And Precisely. that option would be completely taken away. And, Precisely. Yeah, I wouldn't like that either. So, okay. And I, I hated that as a student. <laughs> oh, I hated that as a student. Okay. So I have a question. Um, Yes. Um, this is mainly for objective tests, but my tests are more subjective. Can I use that same rich grading, those tools? Oh yeah, yeah. You ha you'll have, as you'll see in a minute, you have okay. both objective okay. and subjective oh, question types right. that you can okay. put into these tests. All right. Um, let's see. Good. You do have some more draconian restrictions you can apply. Um, uh, requiring a password to get into the test. You'd usually only use that if the student were going to take the test in front of a proctor and you'd arranged with someone to proctor the test for you. We used to have local high school principals and even clergymen <laughs> serve as test proctors early in the day in the online uh, online courses and you'd supply the password to the proctor and the student couldn't get into the test until they sat in front of the proctor that doesn't come up so much anymore or you can filter by ip address which is not something that's likely to be useful for you unless you're like giving a test in a group in a classroom and you're using canvas to provide the test in lieu of putting it on paper and then you can filter IP address ranges to the ones that are assigned to the college as opposed to student what students might have at home. But that's not likely to be an issue either. Okay, we have these same assigned to options that we had with the homework assignment. And you can set due dates, same way. Display until dates. Display uh, available from dates available from today at noon or 12 a.m. first thing in the morning. And you can create, uh, 
you can allow students to take it outside of that date range by adding another set of, uh, uh, of student assignments and a different set of availability dates. Just the same thing that we did with homework assignments. So you can give early or late access to the test where appropriate. And there's another question that may be percolating through someone else's mind due to that last discussion there. And that's how do I give my DSPS students extra time on the test automatically? And that's not done here, that's done in a different place and I'll show you how to do that after we get this test created. So I've set all of my test options or at least considered them. Now I'm ready to add questions to the test. Under the question tab, I basically have three buttons, new question, new question group, and find questions. And we'll take a, each of these in turn. If we're adding questions in the Canvas from scratch, if we're actually just typing the questions in to Canvas, we'll select the new question button. And this will be the first question on our test. We can optionally give the question a name. It doesn't really matter. Um, and we can decide what type of question we're going to add here. And Canvas has quite a variety of question types, the multiple choice being the most common objective question, certainly, but also true, false, fill in the blank, fill in multiple blanks. You can have a sentence with multiple blanks in it that the students have to fill in the words for. Multiple answer questions talk about th something students hate, <laughs> a multiple choice question with more than, that could have more than one right answer. So no multiple guessing there. <laughs> You've got, really got to know your stuff. And those are almost as effective as essay questions in terms of assessment, but they're universally unpopular. If you made a whole test out of those, you'd probably have to, you'd probably have students standing outside your door with torches and pitchforks, but uh, into each life, some rain must fall. Multiple drop downs is kind of cute. I'll show you one of those in a minute. Matching question, fairly standard. Numerical answer, where they have to do a computation, like work a word problem and put an answer in. All of those are objective question types, where Canvas can actually grade the question or grade the response for you. And, and automatically apply the requisite amount of credit to the student's test grade. Then things get a little bit more. Uh, then we get to the more subjective question types, like the classic being an essay question. For Canvas, an essay question is anything that the student has to type something to answer, other than just selecting an option from a list. This can be anything from one word, a one word answer to a several paragraphs. It's all considered an essay question by Canvas. There's no quote short answer unquote question type in Canvas. They just use the essay question for that as well. And the essay, the answer can be of any length depending on your, uh, your directions for the question. A file upload question um, is one that's very, very similar to a homework assignment, actually, where the student would have to, in the course of a test, a timed test, the student would have to create a file and upload it to satisfy this question. It's often used for timed writing assignments. If you want to have the student have to write a, to satisfy a, a writing assignment right then and there in in class, as it were, virtually, in a limited amount of time, you would use a file upload question in a quiz rather than a homework assignment, where within the due date and availability limitations, they can take as much time as they want. Uh, the file upload question. Uh, allows you to do timed writings, which is kind of neat. 
or text would just be like a, an internal header in a test, like the, the, the following questions refer to this diagram. And you could put the diagram there, and then the next four questions would refer back to that. You can do that with the text, no question, question type, not really a question. But let's, let's see what putting a multiple choice question in looks like. And the others are pretty similar. Um, first, you type the question text. Um, which of the following can be used to create screencasts? Don't worry about the, the content, just the idea, the concept. Uh, so there's the text of the question. Now I answer each, uh, now I put in each of several possible answers. How about Zoom is one tool. Uh, snag it. Don't worry if these don't mean anything. Um, Screencast-O-Matic. Remember, some of these could be nonsense words, right? And the final answer, how about all? This is why you don't shuffle answers. <laughs> Okay, so you type in your possible answers, or you, if you had this on a Word doc, if you had these questions already typed on a Word document, you could copy paste the text and the possible answers over without having to retype, especially if they were longer you know, chunks of text, save you some time that way. And the last thing you have to do, since Canvas is not yet capable of figuring out what the right answer is, hopefully I won't live long enough to see it where, see things where Canvas would actually be smart enough to do that. Though I could get by because I'm retired, <laughs> but that, that gets to the point where they don't need us anymore. You know? So I don't want to see that in my lifetime. But um, we do have to tell Canvas which one is actually the right answer. By default, it'll mark the first answer correct. So you have to uh, tell it that, oh, that might or might not be the correct answer. But in this case, it's not. It's all of the above is the correct answer. So I just move my mouse cursor down this column here and click next to the correct answer. And that marks it for Canvas. So Canvas can now grade this question. Also, I can assign a point value for the question. So I can do that later as well. So it's a pretty straightforward interface. It's actually quicker than typing it out in a Word document if you're creating new questions from scratch, which you might have to do if you put these tests online because those old uh, multiple choice questions are going to get out uh, for some people, I guarantee it. So there's our question. Now we just to add that question to the test, we just click update question and we're ready to put the next question in. We can do that, we can just keep doing this over and over. Let me show you that um, uh, multiple drop down type. I like that. That's something you couldn't do on paper. It's kind of a multiple, multiple choice question. Let me pick multiple drop downs. Okay, so um, screencasting tools like, and then to set in a group of or a, a placeholder for a drop down menu, I do square bracket open, uh, call it tools. And call it anything I want. That's a, a variable name like that can be used for and square bracket for what? For appli various applications. So they're going to get this sentence, and each of these variables is going to be replaced by a drop down menu. 
so I can show uh, possible answers for the first one here, tools. And I enter possible answers very much like multiple choice and possible answers. Uh, this would be Zoom. Uh, screencast Omatic. Uh, I can add more answers if I need them. Uh, Camtasia. Or I can have my personal favorite. My students always knew that if they didn't have the faintest freaking idea about the answer to the question, that all of the above was always a good bet because of my fondness for that. And I have to tell Canvas which of those is correct, so just like I did with the multiple choice. Now I go back to the applications variable and um, lecture capture is one possible application. Um, software tutorials, add another answer. Um, grading feedback, or the ever popular in my case, all of the above. <laughs> Uh, that was that was so easy. Um, and then update the question. Now I've got two questions. I'll show you what that actually looks like when the student takes it here in a minute. All right, so I've got two questions, and I can just keep adding questions until I get to the number that I feel is adequate to test this material. An essay question, I'll just show you that. Um, new question to show you that interface is very simple. Uh, an essay question is nothing but question text. You just type in the essay question and click update question. And then the student will be provided in the middle of the test, will be provided with a rich content editor box into which they can type their answer. And the answer can be of any length. So I'll just cancel that one out because I'm going to pull in some essay questions in another way here in a minute. So that's what you do if you were typing new questions from scratch. But let's say in a, you have, you're in the enviable position of having some question banks in your course, collections of test questions that you can reuse. You might get those from your publisher or from a colleague, or you might have created them yourself earlier. Or you might have some old tests from a previous semester that you copied over into this course, and you could pull questions from those as well. To do that, to spe select specific questions from question banks or old tests, you use the find questions button. When you do that, you get a list in the, uh, you get this fine quest, quiz question box here, and you get a list on the left of all the question banks that you have available to you, and how many questions are in each. So this pool for screencasting has seven, I'll, I'll go to it. And there they are. So you can pick a couple of questions there from that question bank and you click add questions and those appear in your test bang and you didn't have to type them. That's really nice. <laughs> um, I can do that multiple times. I can find questions in a different test bank now. I'll pick this one because I believe these are essay questions. Yeah. I'll pick question that question. Question seven has no meaning here. It doesn't mean it's going to be the seventh question in my test. That's just the name that was given to that one at some point. So I select the question I want. I add selected questions. Okay. Every student, so I can add questions very quickly and select them and curate them individually. And every student who takes this test will get those first uh, 
one, two, three, four, five questions. So did question seven, Dave, go in automatically as an essay question with the rich, uh, rich text they can answer it? Yep, because it was created as an essay question, indeed. And if you want to see more detail on the questions in this display, you can click this box right here, and that will show you that that one is an essay question, because there's no possible answers after it. All right, thank you. Could have done that to start with, sorry. So we've got some questions. Every student that we've picked specifically, and every student will get this set of questions. But let's say we'd also like the students to get some questions that were selected by Canvas at random so that no two students get exactly the same test. To do that, we use question groups. And you have to name the group just to distinguish it from other groups that you might put into the same test doesn't matter what you name it, as long as it makes sense to you. And to, and you have to tell Canvas which question bank. You can only do this if you have question banks or old tests available. You can't do this if you're starting off from scratch. You gotta have question banks. So you're gonna tell Canvas which question bank to pull from, and you can only pull from one question bank per gr question group. So let's see, there was one here that had seven questions, which that was the pool for screencasting, right? So I'll select that one. And I, I just select that bank. And I know there are seven questions in that bank. So maybe I'll have Canvas pick three for each student. So each student's gonna get three questions from that pool or question bank. but each student will presumably get a different combination of three questions. But so I'm picking three out of seven, so there's gonna be some duplication among students, but probably no two students are gonna get the same three questions. And even if they do, they won't be in the same order. So it's better, of course, if you have bigger question banks and you pick smaller, you know, very small numbers of questions from them, then the chances of students getting the same questions different students getting the same questions is much reduced. So I can, I tell Canvas how many questions to pull from that bank for each student. And then I set the number of points for all of them. And I create the group. Now that represents three more questions. Uh, and I don't okay. have to, Yes, go ahead. Could I also select all of the questions, in which case they would just be in a different order? Yes. And could I make different groups where in one group, I only, let's say I have three questions, I only want to pick one. And then in a different yes. group that I create, I can say I want all the questions, but they will be in different orders? Yeah, but you wouldn't want to use the same test bank because the students would be guaranteed then of getting one question twice. Right, right. It would be or, a different yeah. set of questions then. And can I right, mix, exactly. uh, I'm, like I said, I'm working on the exam, so I could make some questions that are always in the same order, but then other questions are in a random order, and in another group of questions, only one question is selected out of three? Yes. Okay. All of the above. Okay, cool. Thank <laughs> My you. favorite answer. All of the above. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. When you're doing uh, new questions, you know, from scratch, why doesn't right. Canvas have a random a randomization for the order of the questions? They they just that's not a feature of Canvas. Oh, why not? It's so obvious. That's a good question. <laughs> and there's under the help tool, there's an option to select to submit a feature idea to Canvas. Okay. And you might okay. you might do that. <laughs> I've wondered that myself because Blackboard had an option where it, if you even if you selected or typed in this, you know, a, a set of questions that all students would get, it had an option that would randomize the order in which they were presented. Yeah. Canvas you, does not, Canvas doesn't have that feature. And if you make your own uh, question from scratch, can you put that in question bank? I wasn't able to. Yes, you can. Not so, from within the test. I'll show you how to add 
I'll show you how to find your question banks and how to add something to it here in just a second, okay? Sure. So the point I do want to make that was implicit in the answer to a couple of those questions is that you can have more than one question group in a single test because you might want to pull questions from more than one test bank. If I wanted to pull questions from uh, this screencasting general here, it's like the bank, and maybe I just wanted one from that because I happen to know those are essay questions, um, and maybe make those worth 10 points each, or 10 points for that one. So I can have multiple question groups. I do have to name the group. I've linked it to a question bank. I've told it to pick one question for each student out of those three at 10 points per question and create the group. So now I, I can have as many question groups within a test as I wish. Or in fact, if my question banks were arranged in, in a, like by chapter or something like that is common, and this were a chapter test, I could just create the test by just making one question group and telling Canvas to pull, say I had 100 questions in that question bank, I could tell Canvas to pull 25. And that would be the whole test. And every student would get a completely, it would get a completely randomized or different test with some duplication, but not a lot. So the question group's a very powerful tool in creating quizzes in Canvas. You can generate a test New York Minute using question groups, if you have the test banks to support it. And that's where some of those old publishers' CDs and things like that might come in handy. Because you can add question banks to Canvas in a number of ways. Let me save and publish this test. And I'm going to show you in a minute what it looks like to the student taking it. But to look at your question banks, you go to the quizzes tool and to this little unmarked menu button in the far upper right of this page, just to the right of the add quiz button, there's a manage question banks option. I will not tell you how long it took me to find that first time I went looking for it. Even though I'd been a, an LMS administrator for 20 years at the time, it took me a while to find this one. Actually, I think I had to Google it. But there, here are your question banks. You can create question banks just like you can create tests in much the same way. You just click into that and you can add questions to it. You can also move questions around between banks, like this pool for screencasting has a number of questions in it. I can go to each question has a little link in the lower right hand corner in this display that says move or copy it to another bank. This is something used to be nearly impossible to do in Blackboard. Let's say I wanna move this into that new bank. I just click on that link. I tell it which bank, new bank, to move that into. And if I want to copy the question rather than move it, I just click this option that says, keep a copy in this bank as well. So I'm making a copy of the question rather than moving it from one bank to the other. And I just click move copy questions. And now if I go back and look at the new bank, it has that question in it. Can I so, uh, move my new questions in later into a new bank that I created? Let's say I make all my questions yes. from scratch and then I can move them into a bank that I just created. Yes. Without making the question in the bank. Right. Okay. You, I try to do that, you know, that little move the copy, uh, move right. slash copy question. That link does not come from my build from scratch question, that little clickable link. But you won't see it in a quiz, but. When you make a quiz, oh, My Canvas is also puts that quiz in as a, as a question bank. 
So if you go to manage question banks, you'll find that quiz there as well. And now you have the option to move those questions. You know, my, that quiz that's is counterintuitive, but it, that's the way it works. Because oh. Canvas treats old quizzes just like question banks. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. How would you have known that? You wouldn't unless you'd gone in and looked at your question banks and said, wait a minute, I didn't make that. <laughs> that's one of my quizzes. How'd that get in there? Well, Canvas does that automatically for you without telling you anywhere it's doing that. So that's not the most intuitive feature of the Canvas interface, I will admit. And I, again, I won't tell you how long it took me to figure that out. And how do we get into this uh, question bank thing again? Good question. You go to quizzes. The quizzes tool is the only way in. Mm -hmm. And it's hidden over here in the corner. Oh my God. Okay, and then you click on that menu, and the the main option there is manage question banks. Then it shows you your question banks. How come my that particular quiz is missing from my question bank? I just now did on the other side. Hmm. My, uh -huh. Have you published it? No, I haven't published it. But I'm, it, I, I, I don't think it'll show up until you publish it. Oh, but I'm not ready. As a matter of fact, it, I'm not certain about this but it may not show up until students have actually taken it and uh, show up the in there. I'm, not, I'm not quite sure exactly when they show up in here come to think of it i i've the only other noticed quizzes that i haven't fact. published showed up meaning the other ones that i got from the test banks those showed up as a quiz and it shows on the question bank too but the one i imported from another course from a different school uh, I exported as a. Oh, as a, it was an imported quiz. Yes, it shows that as might a quiz, make, but not as a question bank. Yeah, that might make a difference. Uh, I'll have to look into that. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I'll look into that. I'm not quite sure if that does make a difference or not. Okay, I did That's email a situation you. Situation I haven't run into. Not? Okay, thank it you. It sounds like it probably does. Yeah. Um, yeah, they may have that in there to prevent you from like pulling stuff out of publishers, test banks and so on. I don't know. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll look into that. Okay. Thank Good you. Good question. Good question. I'll send you a screen. Uh, how, about, how about sending me an email to remind me to send that to you when I find out something about it? Sure. Uh, do we have capability of sharing my, our screen with you right now? No, right? Uh, uh, right now, not th not this minute, but that is a capability of Zoom. Yes, yeah. and if in the question and answer period, if you need to do that, yes, I'll turn that on. Okay, that it's uh, right. it's turned off right now to uh, minimize the possibility of Zoom bombing. <laughs> That's one of the things <laughs> okay. you can do in Zoom to uh, prevent some miscreant from coming into your meeting and sharing pornography or something on everybody's screen. So it's a recommended procedure in Zoom now to disable participant screen sharing until you're ready to invite people to do it. Okay. And you can do that on the fly in Zoom. Another seminar. <laughs> there are lots of good uh, things you can do in Zoom and all this, this silly publicity they've gotten late, lately about, oh, this, this wrong and that's wrong and so on. And, it's such a wonderful tool, and these things are easily handled. It's it's a tempest in a teapot, in my view. Okay, uh, let me pull up my <laughs> outline here and see what I've forgotten. Okay, taking tests is really very. Let me just show you quickly what I what this looks like to a student. I publish that test. If I go to here and go in as a student. Here's my sample quiz I just created. The student clicks on that and clicks take the quiz. And here's what the quiz looks like. The multiple choice questions are very simple. You just select the right answer. The multiple drop downs is cute. 
that's a different way to do multiple choice. It's a lot quicker for the students, really. Um, here's an essay question. They even get spell check. <laughs> and um, oh, there's that same question again. Oops. <laughs> Here's another essay question and so on. Here's another one. So these are what the essay questions look like. They're just rich content editor windows. The student can upload videos, create hyperlinks. These can be very rich answers. And so on. I'm just going to tree the rest of the uh, objective questions here and submit. Oh, the student gets a a, a, a list here. It shows them what they have and haven't answered, so they don't accidentally forget something, hopefully. Uh, it gives them a, a rundown timer, lets them know how much time they've got left, and they can hide it if they don't want the pressure. And finally, when the student's ready, they can submit. It does warn them that they haven't answered some questions. I don't have time right now, so I'm going to take the hit. Click OK, really submit it. Boom, they get a receipt that shows them that it did go through and shows them what their current score is. And that's the objective part of the test. That's what the, que the credit they got for the objective part of the test. The rest of it, you have to grade. So let me leave student view, go to the grade book as me. Come on. <laughs> there. Uh, go to the grade book, find this quiz, which is probably all the way out to the right because I just added it. There it is. There's that attempt. You go into the speed grader. There's the student's test paper. You can see what they got right and wrong so far. If you feel like, if you, at this point, if you felt like you may, maybe you had a bad question, the answers were ambiguous, you could override a student's uh, grade for that question, give them credit for it. Um, you can uh, then grade the essay questions. I only answered one, so that one's maybe worth eight points. And the others you could grade as well. I'm just going to tree this. That's all the, nope, that's an essay question. And then update the scores so that the student gets an actual complete score now. Out of 35, it's a little better than 50% not so hot. Uh, <laughs> didn't have time to finish the test. And then you can add comments just as you can with um, uh, homework assignments and graded discussions. Submit that grade and the student's grade appears in the grade book in the same way. And then they'll be able to view it in their grades tool just as we saw with the homework assignments. So very similar process. So Dave, can you, can you <clears throat> yes. excuse, me. excuse me, can you add mm -hmm. a rubric to the, to the questions uh, where you're grading them? Yes. Okay. Just like on the uh, other assignments. The, like a homework assignment. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, Let's see, and let me look again. There was one other thing. Oh yes, how to give extra time for DSPS students. To do that, you go to the quiz in question, our sample quiz in this case, and go to moderate this quiz. 
This will only be visible if you've published the test. Here you have a list of all your students, including current attempts for my test student. But let's say test student number three is a DSPS student. I had given a time uh, availability of 10 minutes for this test to everyone. If I want to give this student one and a half times or two times the um, duration to uh, take the test, they, they seem to change their minds from time to time on which is correct. Um, I go to this little pencil icon opposite that student and I add, in this case, I'd add at least an extra five minutes to that student's available time or maybe 10 minutes if I wanted to give them twice the time. I can also give individual students extra attempts if that's appropriate without having to give an extra attempt to everyone. And I just save those options. And that is noted here in this moderate quiz display. So you're reminded that you have given uh, each or that student five extra minutes or one and a half times the uh, time value, uh, time availability. And you can see this student has two attempts left rather than just one for the other students or zero for the student who's already taken. So you can make all sorts of individual accommodations using the moderate quiz tool. Huh. Okay, oh gosh. 416, I'm sorry, but there were a lot of good questions. I, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> Went a little bit over because I answered those questions in context. I like to do that because I think the answers mean a lot more to everyone if they're given in context rather than at the end of the session. However, we do have some good questions that I see over here in the chat tool, which I'm going to answer now. And I'll answer any other questions that you haven't put in there yet or that you just want to ask. I'd like to get the ones in the chat tool first because those folks have been waiting patiently. Thank you. Uh, but um, I, I will stay here until you run out of questions. You can try to set a record if you want to on this. Okay, I'm going through the chat tool. I have issues of importing quizzes from another school. I'm going to ask when we get to that topic. Okay, uh, so how do you import quizzes from another school? Uh, are you uh, like importing all the quizzes from a uh, course at another school or just some of them? Uh, you're muted, Sama. Actually, the question is, the answer is substantially the same either way, come to think of it. If you want to bring quizzes in from another course, whether it be a course at this institution or at another one, you start off the same way. You go to your settings menu for this course and go to import course content. If the course is on our system, if it's another one of your courses, you would go to copy a Canvas course. If it were from another institution, you would have what's called a Canvas course export package provided to you. Perhaps you downloaded it from your uh, one of your courses on another institution's Canvas server or perhaps it was provided to you by a colleague. Either way, it'll be a, a specially formatted zip file that you're gonna upload into Canvas and deploy into Canvas. I don't have a course export package that has quizzes in it right now. So to demonstrate this process, I'll go to copy a Canvas course, but it's exactly the same process either way. You just have to, it just varies by what's, what the source of the uh, quizzes is. You go to copy a Canvas course. You have to tell Canvas where 
the questions are currently located in the in this case so you have to tell it what course to copy from if this were a canvas export package you wouldn't have to make this selection because canvas would assume they were in the file it would just ask you to tell it where the zip file was but in this case i have to find it normally you would see a list of your courses here but I have to search for them because I have so many on the system, it couldn't display them all. But this is a course that I know has some quizzes in it that I might be able to import. If I'm importing just quizzes, I'm not gonna take all the content. I'm gonna take selected content. And then I just click import. And I'm given a button here. I've done this several times in this course. So this is the latest job on top here that we just started. I've got um, a button that says select content. I click on that and there's all sorts of con types of different content that I could select to pull over from that course into this one. In this case, I'm interested in quizzes. So I go to the quizzes link. If I want to take all the quizzes, I just check that box right there that takes them all. But if I want specific quizzes, but not all of them, I can click this little right arrow and I can select the quiz I want to bring over or quizzes, like these unnamed quizzes here. <laughs> oh, that's unpleasant because I've, I've already pulled some of these over. I don't think I've pulled that one or that one. Okay, so I'll select those two. Let's say those are the two I want. Then I just click select content and Canvas will automatically pull those in and stick them into your quizzes tool. Usually doesn't take very long. You get this little, di this little progress indication and it's completed. So now if I go to quizzes, my quizzes tool in this course, I'll see two new quizzes. The um, new test 1920 and the module one quiz were both brought over. So that's how you copy or move quizzes between one course and another whether it's on our system or if the quizzes are coming from another system, it would be the same process, except that when you do the copy, or rather when you, do, when you start the import, if you select Canvas course export package, instead of asking you which course, it actually, it asks you which file am I gonna import these from? Otherwise, it's exactly the same process in each case. Okie dokie. Uh, Dave, did you already explain the first question, <laughs> how to drop a homework assignment, you know, the worst homework assignment or the worst exam? Did you explain Oh, it dropped the lowest grade in a group? Yeah. Yes, I will, I will be happy to do that. To, let me get through the uh, questions on specifically on assessments here in the chat tool. Hold that thought though and ask me again in just a minute and I'll show you how to do that. All right. Can I ask you quickly on this import export? If you are exporting, yes. which is the better choice as a course or export package? Um, if I'm you sorry, to, I, I lost you somewhere there. <laughs> oh, sorry. So if you want to copy this quiz to another course, same, right. uh, another, let's say another institution, then you want to first export a package, right? Which Correct. one is better? Do you select the uh, copy course and then choose the quiz or do you start as a copy export package? It, yeah, if you want to move this, if you have quizzes in this shell, that you want to share, uh, that you want to put into another course at another institution, mm -hmm. your first option or your first task would be to export this content. Mm -hmm. And you have a choice when you export to export the entire course or one or more quizzes. Uh, I did the quiz. 
Is that yeah. correct? Okay. Yeah, that's if you're moving quizzes, yes. And um, then you would just create the export, and that'll take a minute. Oh, that didn't take long. And you get a new this new export link is the one just created. Mm -hmm. And you just click on that, and that will allow you to save that file to your local hard drive. You put it somewhere where you'll find it again. And notice it's a zip file, which is yeah. what you expect. Now you can go to another course at another institution. Let me just, this is a jump course I use for things like this. Then you go to settings, Not import good. course content. Content type is Canvas Course Export Package. That's what you created when you exported the quizzes from the other course. Yeah. You choose the file, which I seem to remember I put in downloads, Canvas Course Exports. Quiz export, there it is. That one, click open. And in this case, I presume you just select, you just selected the quizzes you wanted in that case. So you take all the content and you would then import them into this course. And that will drop those quizzes into the quizzes tool on, in this course. Okay. Did that answer your question? Yeah. It, uh, the only issue I ran with that is now I cannot use those questions to transport into the question bank. Yeah. Let's look at that. That was the look at that it here. Ended That's... up. It's just went into the quizzes. Yep. Same thing happened here. So I'm not sure what you can do about that, but I will look into that for you. Okay. Okay. And somebody else had a question. Uh, hey, I want to ask you a question. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Dave, I'm Tessie Bonner, and I have never done an online class before. I'm in the um, cosmetology department at City College, and my question was, how do I go about to get the syllable to start the Canvas class? Because someone was telling me, I haven't done any modules or anything. I've taken four years, but this is the fifth class I've taken from you. So and I haven't done you, anything uh, really. To... Gotcha. So what you really need is a, just a basic introduction to Canvas from, from scratch, right? More or less, yes. Yeah, I hear you. Um, we do have one of those coming up. Um, and we may be scheduling some more. But I do have a, an immediate option for you that you can do right as soon as, whenever you wish. And that okay. is to go to our, um, and I, but I'd love to have you in the next live one that we do, and I'll look that up in a minute. But something you can do anytime is to go to our on-demand website. Let me put that, yeah. uh, let that yeah, link I have in. That. I, have, I have the link for the on-demand website. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, SBCCDOLVID.org, right? Yes. Let me put that there for everybody, just in case. Um, okay, I put that in the chat tool. So, but you can go to Workshop Archives at the top of the screen. Workshop. And workshop archives. And they're all of our, these seminar sessions, almost all of them have been recorded and put in here. A couple of them I forgot to record. <laughs> but there are multiple, um, multiple, exa uh, multiple instances of Canvas overviews. Okay. The most recent one being from the 27th of March, but there's a bunch of others in there too. 
and you can look at any of the, they are like two hours plus questions. Okay. But that, that can get you started. I'd love to have okay. you come to our next uh, general one. Let me see here. That was, oh, let's see, I have that on a Word document coming to it. Just a sec, looking that up, here we go. This is the eighth, so there we are. Looks like the next one, oh darn it. The next one's not until the seventh scheduled right now, the seventh of May. And I'm sure you'd okay, like to have I, it before then. I tell you what, I'm I, well, I think we're going to be scheduling some more of those. And when we do, Mary okay. Kingsley will send out a notice to everyone, and you'd be very welcome. Okay. In that one, okay. But in the meantime, Thank that recording is is a live the recording of a live section that uh, I did on that very I will look for that later on today. Thank yeah, you. And, and I'm about to forget. I've been working on this for two days. I don't know why I forget it, or actually a lot longer than that. On this site, under LMS tutorials, at the top here, there's a an entry called Broad Strokes, Quick Canvas Tutorials. And these are meant to get someone who's never used Canvas or any other LMS for that matter, up to speed as quickly as possible with a minimum amount of time engaged in watching tutorials. They vary in length from five minutes to 17 minutes each and there's only one that's over uh, 10 minutes long. And those are there and I'm add, I've got another one just about ready to put up there. Um, everything, uh, the basics of what we talked about with quizzes today are in there. There's one on quizzes. There's one on um, uh, adding content to your Canvas course, creating modules. One on an anatomy of, of a typical Canvas course, what a Canvas course looks like so you know what you're working toward, how to get into Canvas, so on. And they're... Like I say, they average between they average about seven or eight minutes each. So that's where I'd go first, rather than going two hours through this recording. I'd try these first and see if I got my questions answered before I dove into one. I was gonna have you know have to bring a, a six pack to get through. So uh, just a thought. Again, that's under LMS tutorials quick Canvas tutorials. Try to save you some time. All righty, let's see. Great session today. Lots of good questions. Thank you for all those. Uh, okay, how do I drop, I just got to the one on homework, on how to drop the lowest grade in a uh, in a group of questions or a group of assessments, I should say. Okay, you, Kathy, you put that very responsibly. Put that into the chat tool. <laughs> We've gotten down to it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take that one right now. Uh, I put you off a little bit earlier because this was gonna be a long answer because there's a lot of. Uh, there's some infrastructure we have to have first in place. Can I qualify this question? When I Absolutely. Started, you know me, when I started, I just kind of went in and didn't do everything correctly. So I have uh, three different elements that I wanted, well, two elements I want to drop, one out of one of those elements, types, okay? And one out of another type. Right. But I haven't separated those types. Like you have with assignments, you have test, you have mm -hmm. dialogue or whatever that's called. See what I mean? But I didn't make that distinction. In my grade, well, it's all in mm -hmm. as assignments. Right. Now, 
give you him can, that. You can change. You can change that at any time. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> I think was the question that was at the top That's of your right. mind. Wasn't it? <laughs> Have I have I have I irretrievably messed up? That's right. <laughs> F U B Fubar <laughs> Foul, fouled up beyond all rep, rec, uh, redemption. That's right. No, you are not Fubar. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Having spent some time in that state myself, I, I empathize. Okay, uh, and this is probably ooh. That's not the course I wanted to be in, excuse me, to demonstrate this, pardon me. Uh, this one should do. Okay, the answer begins with the assignments tool in the course menu. This is a, an area or a list of all of the gradable assessments in your course, which was what we were talking about all day. Everything, every gradable item in your course automatically gets listed in the assignments list here. When you first get the shell, all of them are listed in just one group. There's a, a what's called a question, or excuse me, an assignment group. There's just one in there and it's named assignments plural and everything all the quizzes any quizzes you create go into that any gradable discussions you create go into it any homework assignments you create go into a single assignment group named assignments and if you don't if you weight your grade your grade computation by the number of points you assigned each individual assessment and if you don't want to drop the lowest grade in any group of assessments, that's all you need. You don't have to create multiple assignment groups unless you want to do one of the, unless you want to weight your grade computation by assignment group, or you want to drop the lowest grade in a group. If either one of those is true, you're going to have to create multiple assignment groups and group your assessments by type. And you decide how many assignment groups you need by how many subdivisions you have of, of assessments in your course. I've just grouped them by, I put all the tests quizzes together, I put all the gradable discussions together and all the homework assignments together. But you might have different kinds of tests, for instance. You might have um, like a daily quiz, a set of daily quizzes. And then you might also have chapter tests or, or section tests, and then a final exam. If you wanted to weight those separately, or if you wanted to drop the lowest grade just in that group, you'd have to create a separate assignment group for your daily quizzes and another one for your re, uh, uh, sectional tests and another one for your final exam which would probably only have one in it, and so on but just depending on how you uh, award your grades you're going to have a varying number of assignment groups that you might have to create um, and you can create groups from the top of this screen just by clicking add group and um, give the group a name is all you have to do and you so you can create assignment groups bang 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 once you have them created you can move individual assessments which are probably already listed here into those groups so um, i don't happen to have any imported assignments so I don't need that group, I'm just gonna delete it. I must have imported something at one point, that's why that was created automatically. But um, if I want to move a, a individual assessments from one assignment group to another, and here we get into that issue with Canvas's inconsistent use of the word assignment. 
Sometimes when Canvas uses the word assignment, they mean a homework assignment, a specific type of assessment. Other times, like when Canvas labels this the assignments tool, they're using the word assignments to mean any assessment, anything that's graded in your course. And sometimes it's hard to figure out which way they're using that word. If, and I have made the suggestion to Canvas, they should change this to assessments. Right. Instead of just assignments, because that's what these all are. They're things that you grade, that contribute to the student's grades. Those are assessments, not necessarily assignments in the more limited use of the word. I think I know why they won't do that because that's how Blackboard used to do it. And I think they, they just, they don't want to risk looking like or acting like Blackboard in any way. It's anathema to their culture. So that's just a guess. But anyway, I apologize for the ambiguity. I'm trying my best to elucidate it, but it's hard <laughs> because I keep doing it. My, my apologies. So I can, assort these various assessments between quote assignment groups unquote and that gives me the capability to do a couple of things that i couldn't do if i didn't set this structure up one of those is to weight my grades by assignment group instead of by individual assessments <clears throat> which means i don't have to worry so much about how many points I assign to individual assessments. It doesn't matter because Canvas applies the weights over top of that. So I can go and uh, select assignment groups weighting and I can click this box here that says weight final grade based on assignment groups. And however many assignment groups I have, I can apply a percentage weight out of 100 to each one. And as long as this adds up to 100, I'm golden. And that just vastly simplified your, particularly your process of making quizzes. Because if you're weighting your grade computations by the number of points possible for each assessment, when you're making a quiz or a final exam or whatever, you have to be very careful about the number of points you award to each question within the test so as to make the total points possible for the test come out to a value that's consistent with your overall weighting of individual assessments, which is a pain in the keister. If you do it, if you do your weighting by assignment groups, you don't have to worry about that. One of your quizzes could have 10 points in it and another one 15 and another one five, and they would all be weighted the same if you weight by assignment groups. Canvas just computes the percentage grade for each item and uses that instead of the total, instead of the actual number of points. So that's one thing you can do if you set up assignment groups like this, multiple assignment groups. The other thing you can do, oh, that's not where, not where I wanted to go, is you can drop the lowest grade in a, within an assignment group, or the highest grade if you like, if you want to be mean. Um, test, uh, so you can go to the top of the assignment group here, to the context menu for the group as a whole, and edit the assignment group. One of the things that that allows you to do is change the name of the group if you need to. The other thing is change its weight. But in addition to that, this is where you can drop the lowest scores or the highest scores in the group. They tell us we're, if, we, if you drop the lowest grade, you're supposed to drop the highest grade too. So you get rid of the outliers. Yeah. I say, faw. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've never been able to be that mean with my students. But, but uh, yes, I know it's, huh? If you're not doing weights, you're doing points. Right. Can you skip the weight? I mean. Yeah. How, In that event, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have a weight here. You wouldn't have Okay. It's just not there. Okay. 
Good. But you'll still have the option to drop the lowest or the highest grade. Right. Okay. Does that answer your question? It does. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. You bet. <laughs> you weren't the only one who had that question, Kathy. <laughs> I wasn't. Very good. That's okay. the beauty of the question. Now. Thank you so much. You bet, Sabine. Okay, take care. Thanks for coming. All right. Let's see. Where was I? Ah. So Can you embed a fillable table? I answer. I you answer have already answered. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah. The only issue I have is oh, by the way, I knew as I was in the meeting, a question came from the student who were taking the test that their images were not loaded, so they couldn't answer the question. So whoops. I think I think the Safari gives a problem. So I'll have to send them an alert. I have heard that. Yeah, I would recommend to them to do it in Chrome. Yeah. I'll Chrome is that. free and it's available on the Mac. So they're going to have less trouble if they do it in Chrome. I've yeah. had instructors tell me that sudden, uh, for some reason, suddenly all the images in their course vanished when they went into the course on Safari. Yeah, it happened to me too. I was like uh, almost uh, <laughs> yeah. right. Um, another question is now once yeah. they was once they submitted or the time because i had an issue i have several dsps student and i i by mistake i and they have different times you know extended time varied and i think right. one of them, I, by mistake i put the wrong extension like instead of 100 mm -hmm. i just like the other i did 50 so she emailed me that the canvas cut me off before i was done oops now thing is they, she cannot resume right she, it's already she has to no you're gonna so you're I probably gonna have to attempt. yeah right you're gonna add need to add an attempt and you can do that quickly with a quiz yes i already quizzes. did but she said that everything oh, she uh, did already gone she so no no i'm sorry yeah, yeah. So i guess that that's a limitation get, especially in when it's different for different students that's so that's I guess a, that's the limitation with the canvas, huh? I just thought I'll turn on the video. <laughs> uh, well, uh, that's not so much a limitation with canvas as a limitation of the process, the, uh, the instructional process of having different rules for different students. It just means that occasionally there are going to be uh, difficulties. Yeah. Um, but canvas, yeah, canvas can give, you can give any number of extra minutes to any different student. It's not a consistent thing, but you have to know that in advance, of course. And yeah, and the you know, another thing, track you of it. plan in advance, you can only extend the time after you have published the quiz. So correct. Yeah. Correct. So in the right. rush, so you I must have. You can't missed. set that up early on. You have to wait yeah. to publish it, and then remember to do it. Yes. So it, it increases your cognitive load by a ton. Right now, which is very low. <laughs> <laughs> you're, 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 you're bit over double already, right? <laughs> I understand. Yeah, I Why feel like not? drowning sometimes nowadays. So it's just a, anyone who expects perfection under these circumstances is going to be sadly disappointed. Yes. We are all, I know you all are all doing your very best and you're doing an amazing job, quite frankly. I, I can't believe this just didn't blow up into a full-scale riot <laughs> when i when i heard that, oh in two weeks everything's going to be online because i've been warning for well over a month that, you know well yeah so about that, you at some about point that, uh, and um yeah. and i think at the highest levels in the pre in the chancellor's cabinet they were aware of that and they were working toward it but uh there wasn't a a universal appreciation of that at the middle levels of management let me just say and um the uh i mean the idea that we we're going to accomplish all this in just a couple of weeks and do as well as apparently is being done is just amazing you all have done an amazing job and been so adaptive so um so flexible about this you've been running a marathon we're just workshops. we're just in awe that that there wasn't a, just a total meltdown, uh, or I am anyway. I'm I'm just I'm really impressed. 
you all are to be congratulated well, thank, so thank you much. for being all available all the time too. I, I wanted to quickly go back to my uh, earlier question about how the uh, imported quiz uh, vanished from the question bank or I mean never went there. It doesn't show up in the, among the question banks, right? Yeah, I was hoping I can at least get some reprieve from this because <laughs> um, by using the part of my exam for the other course at another institution, which right. you have to build from scratch because lab exam, you don't get the test bank, right? So, um, right. So it looks like that my hope is dashed now. <laughs> well, let's see, uh, which course did I import that into? I imported it into, I'm not certain. Let's take a look. I think yeah, I imported it. You imported into something, yeah. Yeah, I imported it into this one, I believe. And um, if I go to quizzes, it's there. And moderate manage question banks. I don't see those ones I imported. Yeah. But I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I think I remember which two I imported. Let me look at the quizzes tool. I imported a named quiz and new. I think test. that one new test. New test for sure was one of them, wasn't it? Thank you. Okay, let's see what happens when I try to make a quiz. And I try to go to the questions tab and I go to find questions. I don't see it there either. It's not there it's, either. I was yeah, hoping, that's how I I was was hoping like it might well. show up here and mm. not ha having not showed up in the other place, but nope. I will look into that and see if there's any way that can be remedied. Okay, I emailed you too, so that's that's me. If oh, I, thank you, thank you. I was like a few. That way, I, I don't just have to this. remember. <laughs> um, and another thing I noticed. Is... Oh, sorry. No, no, the go thing ahead. I noticed the difference is you know how that move or transfer the other thing, other yeah. question bank. That link just does not show up. That gave me a little. I don't know. I took a screenshot, but unfortunately, I cannot share the screen with you right now you mean when you when you went to select content to transfer so what i did is okay maybe i can just yeah open as a quiz i'll just start transferring the questions from the quiz into other quiz banks i mean question banks but even that option was not available because that click no, on you bottom. don't have that option within a quiz only within a bank oh so um again i'll i'll look into this okay that's see. fine yeah if I can figure out any way to alleviate that. I can't promise, but I'll look. Well, thank Dave, you so much. I have a yes. follow-up question on my question before. When you were explaining okay. how to add assessments, I understood that, but then you said, and then you can just pull them from one group into the other, and I didn't understand how you pull it. Do you grab it and pull it down? Oh, yes. Oh, uh, you mean with among assignment groups? That's right. Yeah, yeah, you can just... Pull them like okay, that. okay, good. That's that's what I needed to know. Got it. Sorry about that. I thought I'd done that. Apologize. Thank you. Uh, I okay. have one more question, um, if I may. I, I don't unless yeah. there's some more about this. I'm getting notification from Zoom that there is an update and I'm a little hesitant. I don't know if oh, I should yeah. do that. Me too. You do want to update your Zoom client because it eliminates that primary difference is it adds a few new features, but the primary difference is it eliminates a very serious security vulnerability that um, was a theoretically enabled someone to invade your course and post a link in the chat tool that if clicked on, could give them access to the person's computer. Oh, okay. It's called, it's called an NFC bug or UFC bug. And uh, you want to update it just for that, if nothing else. Thank you. They have none of the draconian security, uh, the, none of the automatic act or mandatory activation of security options in Zoom that they have been talking about are implemented in Zoom accounts that are part of a corporate group like our confer Zoom accounts. 
so you don't have to worry about something changing in your settings when oh, you import when you update that client that wasn't clear <laughs> initially but we've we've checked it out and that's true your conversion okay. settings will not be messed with okay thank you uh if you have a free zoom account on the other hand it's possible they will be so be aware of that okay thank you okay you bet but yes please do that update it and there's some nice new features in that new update too it's always best to keep that client up to date let's see uh, uh you have any office hours allison i i'm guessing you're probably not here from that post uh anymore but yes i certainly have some i have more time now i'm not doing uh i'm not spending seven or eight hours a day and two seminars a day to uh so i have some time to meet with people uh over zoom or or handle questions by email now and i'm doing a much better job of keeping up with that because i have more time so i'd love to hear from you not sure about that one <coughs> i have a test bank on my computer of questions from the publisher of the text i use are those automatically accessible to me when canvas uh, on from canvas when i click on find questions no it has to be imported into canvas can i somehow upload that test bank into canvas Probably. Uh, publishers' test banks are usually um, uh, designed to import into specific learning management systems. So there may be a test bank for Canvas and another one for Desire to Learn and another one for Moodle. But it so happens that the most common types of test banks provided by publishers <laughs> are either Blackboard test banks or Canvas test banks. And the good thing about that is that is that the format of the files is the same in each case. Blackboard test banks should for, uh, import into Canvas and vice versa, because they both use an import file for, format called a QTI format. I can't remember the um, initialism for that. But when you, to import one of those test banks into Canvas, into a Canvas course, you would go to Settings and Import Course Content. We've seen that before. And the import type is qti.zip file. So chances are, if you have uh, publishers' test banks that you've gotten sometime in the past, maybe when we were on Blackboard, or maybe, maybe it's something you got for Canvas, those should import using this import option. And they should then appear in your question <coughs> banks in Canvas. And I've seen that work a number of times. Another thing you could do, if you had some test banks that you've lost track of, but that you had in a Blackboard course from some time ago, we still have that Blackboard system. We still have all those courses. You can't get to it, but uh, we can. And we could pull those test banks out of the old Blackboard course for you and give them to you so you can import them into Canvas. And test banks exported from Blackboard will import into Canvas because they're the same format. So that's another option if you happen to have some old content on Blackboard that you've kind of forgotten about and thought that just went away. It's still there. We can still get to it. So I'll just mention that as a possibility. Oh, that's sweet. Uh, let me see. Tessie, we talked about how you could get some information, introductory information about it, about Canvas. <clears throat> Oh, this is interesting. With studio art classes, drawing, design, and with my breakdown and my syllabus, I have attendance and participation, which includes the instructor having 10% of the grade that can alter the final grade. Oh, uh, a lady after my own heart. I always kept 
in reserve in that exact way so I could assign it at my discretion to ensure that students got the grade they deserved. Regardless, <laughs> it gave me a letter grade to play with so I could reward good behavior and penalize bad behavior to the extent of, a, of an entire letter grade at need. I love, yeah, I, I empathize. What if I put in ad groups but never saw them? Oh, sorry, that was something, that was another question. That's a second question. Yeah, just figured that out, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so how would you do that in Canvas? I think was the, uh, the question, was it not, uh, Cynthia? Yeah, I'm having a lot of trouble because um, when you have discussions is fine. Um, assignments um, is basically, in some of my classes, it's basically the exams because I didn't know how to, um, like I, some, like to start off with, instead of giving them exams like I had been, which were all visual, um, mm -hmm. I've given them study sheets to be doing where they have right. to use the book and uh, Khan Academy videos. Um, so that's part of what's in assignments, but I've also been putting uh, exams in there. So quizzes yeah. doesn't work for that. In my, in my drawing class um, and things like that, assignments are all the projects. So they're having to upload visual files for me to see. So that's working okay. And discussions is working okay. Good. But I was wondering about is do you, what do you think about putting that subjective grade into quizzes? I mean, it's kind of like their categories aren't really working for me. You could well, but you can create your own category. Uh, what I would do probably with that ten percent is I would make it its own assignment group. It's okay, so participation. That's the second question because I put in assignment groups and they never showed up. Oh, now that shouldn't happen because they would come in down at the bottom here. Okay. So did, you did just what I did. You clicked add group. Yep. And named it and saved it. And I put a percentage in for it. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which you can do if you've already set up to uh, assess. Yeah, I've you, got would, things you might there. have to you might have to readjust your percentages on the others to make room for it. How do I get rid of quizzes? Uh, quizzes you can't get rid of. The quizzes tool just lists all of your quizzes. Okay. Period. No uh, homework assignments, no gradable discussions. That, they're always there. But that doesn't have any, but the assignments tool includes the quizzes as well. But in addition, the homework assignments and the graded discussions. Yeah, the so discussion. the, quizzes, the, quiz, the quizzes list is a subset of the assignments tool. Okay. Why they have a quizzes tool and the assignments tool I have a good answer because it's confusing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I hear you agree. Yeah, because I, you know, I've got my quizzes listed here under quizzes and they're also listed under assignments automatically. I, the quizzes tool is a convenience if you wanna to get to your quizzes quickly and make quizzes quickly and not have to sort through the homework assignments and the, uh, and the uh, graded discussions as well. I guess it's a little quicker, but it just confuses the living daylights out of people. And it's a, it's a design flaw, I think, it comes down to it in Canvas, but it's so embedded now that we'll never get, it'll never change. So, so we if just I have was just starting this, I go to the um, add group. <clears throat> right here. Yeah, would I go there and create my groups and right. then go to the waiting and wait the groups. Right. Or I could I do yeah. it right there, right? Yeah, I would I would just create the group and 
with the name and save it. And then when I want to uh, uh, deal with the weights, I go to assignment group weights in the menu right. up here at the Okay. And there you get them all. Okay. So that's where what I create should show up. Yes. And I just, I just created participation, right? Because I only had these two. And then I created participation. That one shows up there too. So if I don't have quizzes in there, it shouldn't show up. If you don't have an assignment group for quizzes, it won't show up in that list, but you do have quizzes. If you have quizzes in the course, they will show up in the assignments tool. You can't stop them from doing so. Right. So they will show up, but you may not have an assignment group for them, but you can certainly make one. There it is down there. And I can, it'd be easier if I drag that up to the top so I can see it better. Now these are all quizzes, so I can just drop them right in there. So what happens when you go to the grade now, to grade, to grades? Um, to the grade book. Yeah. The order of columns in the grade book changes by default because this order here is your default order in the grade book. Okay. If I go to the grade book now, define screencasting should be the first thing I see. Yep. And then those quizzes in the order that I put them in the assignments tool. That one's unpublished. I probably don't want to see that. Take that out. Um, and there's my participation assignment down there. That's my, actually, that's my participation group, assignment group. These last ones here, starting here, assignments, quizzes, imported assignments, and participation are assignment groups, not individual assessments. So, because I haven't made an individual assessment, I can't put a grade in here. Right. Yeah, I understand that. Okay, good. Now, um, let me let me get a student to work with here, real quick. I can I do just, that by just going. I to just my have home funky group. names for things, so they're kind of like they're going with it. You know, it's like I always go like this, like I always do in the classroom. <laughs> So, that, that's that they're works going with it, as, long as, you know? as long as you and they both understand what you're doing that works so now if i go to the grade book i say i've got an assignment i've got a student in there and the um, um i can't add a grade here but i can so what i need if i'm going to do participation is i need a participation assignment now that I've created the group so I can wait by that group, I'm going to make a participation assignment under the assignments tool is the easiest way. Add assignment. And this is, this is something I gather that you're at the end of the term, you're just going to put a number into this that reflects your uh, gestalt evaluation of how that student participated overall. At least that's the way I always used it. Okay, that's so I'll just, I was thinking about that, but then I was wondering if I should divide it up. Because well, you can do that. Be, is it going to be a hole in their grade, basically, until the last minute? Uh, yes, but uh, if you don't enter anything into it until the last minute, it's not the total column will not take that into account. The total column, the percentage in the total column in the grade book is computed based upon what the students have attempted or been graded for only. It's like a running average rather than a, an overall average. So, so if you don't you enter anything into the participation tool until the last minute or in, into the participation assignment until the last minute, it won't count against them up to that point. Okay. Okay, so assuming you could have multiple 
measures of participation like I'm about to create. I'm just assuming there's just going to be one, but you could have multiples just as easily and put them all into that participation assignment group. I, I considered do, doing it in thirds, like, like February, March, April, and then May. Oh, by chronologically. Yeah, you could do that, that. But again, and, and you could do that. And so you could make a uh, participation first, third, or something like that, or dates. Right. Okay. So I, I that, that maybe, works fine. I thought maybe it would encourage them if they saw that to be sure yeah. they're participating. Good point. So um, you would assign, at this point, it really doesn't assign, uh, since you're waiting by assignment group, it doesn't matter how many points you put in here. So I just put something easy to deal with, like 10 or 100 or whatever doesn't matter what this number is right if you're waiting by assignment group this gives you more leeway if it's a little bigger right yeah exactly indeed if it's a hundred you have a lot more uh, uh, swing yeah uh, resolution <laughs> to the uh, to the thing for submission type in this event you would say no submission because this right. is not something they're going to submit. This is something you're going to put in for them by your own evaluation. Correct. And so that's basically the trick is to make this a no submission assignment and give it an appropriate name and save and publish it. They're not going to see it. I mean, it's not, not anything they can submit or anything like that. But it does create a manually create a column in the gradebook where you can go. And that is way over ready. to the end. No, that's the group. Oh. Where did it go? There it is participation first, third. Usually it goes to the end, but this time it went the, went further up. Oh, that's because I where I created it in the assignment group. Okay, so there it is. And you can just enter a number here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whenever you wish. Now, to complete this process, we're going to go back to the assignments tool. And we're going to go to manage assignment group, or just assignment groups wait uh, in this stealth little menu right here. And I have all these assignment groups. Imported assignments actually is something I probably don't need. Although I do have some stuff in there. All right. Oh, well, I won't worry about that. It's okay. Uh, I understand I, that part. You, you understand what I'm doing. So yeah, now yeah. these have got to add up to 100. So maybe right. this one is 30. This one is 20. This one is 40, and this one is 10, <laughs> and save. Okay, yeah. And now we're going to put that new assignment that I just created, which went up here into assignments. I'm going to put that in participation. So it gets that 10% weight. And then I can make a second third and a third third as well, and put right. those all in there and assign any number of points to them, it doesn't matter. And that's gonna become 10% of their grade, 10% that you absolutely control. Yeah. So you can prevent miscarriages of justice in your course. Exactly, because you know, when they haven't been checking in, you know, it's kind of <laughs> like, you know, slam bang you. <laughs> yeah. And if, uh, you, on the other hand, if you've got, got someone who's trying their best and is working hours right. and hours and has come up just a tiny bit short, this gives you a, a way to boost that student above others who have not tried as hard. Exactly. So, yeah, I, I empathize. And I, I literally could not grade without that in my back pocket. I hated grading badly enough anyway, but to see miscarriages of justice when I knew the student deserved a better grade than they got, uh, I wanted to have a means to ensure that, I, that that would allow me to ensure that that happened. 
I rarely used it to penalize students. I only used it to reward good work. And right. uh, I Seemingly. felt a whole lot better about the whole process because I had it. But um, now one other thing, if I have old Blackboard things um, for another course, how do I get those put into this? Do, who do I tell? Just email me and give me as much information as you can about where it was in Blackboard. If you have okay. the old CRM, that would be perfect. Okay. And I can pull any of that content you need, any or all of the content that you need from that shell, Blackboard shell, and give you a file that you can import into Canvas. Okay, one more thing. Is a rubrics particular to an assignment? You can use rubrics with assignments discussion groups, dis graded discussions, or with essay questions on tests. But each one's individual to however you assign it. Right, each one. Well, actually you can reuse it. If you can make a U rubric generic enough that it would fit for all three, then yes, you can use it. You can reuse a, a rubric for more than one assignment or more, or one or for an assignment and an essay question or something like that. You could reuse the same rubric. Okay. I'm sorry, that's something I just ran out of time to show today. I need to do a rubrics tutorial for everybody because we I just ran out of time on that today. Because I got kind of confused because I assigned one and then I assigned another and then it showed both of them and I thought, oh, do I pick one of those or do I just do a new one for this next? You can do either. Okay. Okay. All right. At least I can answer that question. <laughs> Great questions. Uh, dee, 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 dee. I use a version of Canvas that was created for Cisco information technology training. It has been customized differently from what we were able to do. Hmm, that's interesting, Jerry. Yes, I'd like to maybe share this with you if I could. Um, yeah, I'll just, me, I'll just show it to let you. Me, let me kill my share so you can do that. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> it allows, uh, you know, uh, th they built a module to, the way they built their shield. So with assignments. That all looks fairly standard, yeah. This is their exams. So uh -huh. if we go into, you know, instead of setting it up of a quiz, they set it up as an exam and they well, can go in that's, and- That's just semantics though. To, to Canvas, it's a quiz. Uh, okay. But I mean, but do they have any special features or functions that allows them to do it this way? Where no, they can this, go looks, in? this looks pretty much like a, uh, like Canvas, like so they, I mean, the same thing we have, except okay. that uh, they have created assignment groups differently than you might have otherwise. So they have a different set of assignment groups, but that's a, a normal option in Canvas to do that. And the course menu looks pretty much the same. Okay, so <clears throat> we go there to your modules. modules. And, and they've provided you with pre-made modules and pre-made assessments and so on, which is wonderful. <laughs> saved you a lot of work and right. maintained by their standards. So this yes. is wonderful. Yes. Wonderful. Um, let me see what I was going to ask you. Okay. Well, yeah, that was, that was the main questions I had about, uh, you know, they have the, the quizzes, the students can go in and take these anytime, but the exams, right. they cannot take the exams until they're activated by the instructor. Right. So, I mean, and you can also set prerequisites on exams automatic so that they're applied automatically. So you can say that, well, you can't take this exam until you've made a certain uh, level of grade on a previous assessment of some sort. Right. Like a previous, okay. uh, so they may have implemented some of those policies as well, which okay. we don't usually have time to talk about in these sessions but uh right the um yeah it's uh but that does look just like canvas i mean there's no i'm not seeing anything that's unique to this implementation of canvas yet 
Okay, okay. I th just thought it was something so pretty <laughs> much different. Everything I've said today about our canvas should apply to this as well. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. That's fascinating. Okay. You're welcome. Um, <clears throat> go ahead and unshare it. <laughs> okay. Let <laughs> <laughs> me get back to the. Uh, well, uh, that got me to the bot. Yours was the last question in the uh, chat tool. I have another one. Good. I was going to say, does anybody else have another one? <laughs> but this one's about doc cams and Zoom. Is that okay? Perfect. Okay. So, you know, I went and got that fancy doc cam, I told you. And what Ooh. I did was I plugged it into my USB port. I turned on the power. I turned on the light. I put on my screen share so I'd be on my laptop. Mm -hmm. and it didn't show up now if i remember right you said something about that little square that has a c in it that little uh, icon oh probably this one that one that says cam You got one of the IPVO cameras, right? I did, but I can't find that. The IPVO visualizer software that so they you didn't get a CD with the camera. I did not, and I paid a lot of money for it. Whoa! <laughs> I got the I, step up one. Whoa! Where did where'd you buy it from? I, I I'm bought just it curious. from uh, Amazon.com. Oh, really? I mean, they Amazon didn't provide. Prime. Now, in okay, the well, let me show you. This software is free. It'll only work if you have an IPVO camera, but you can download it from their website. Let me show you where to find it. Okay. Because right, my otherwise, you really can't make good use of this camera. No, you can't. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I'm so sorry that happened. Um, so let's go to IPVO's website here. Okay. Which is just IPEVO.com. And let's see, here we go. It's uh, right now anyway, it's this green square. You scroll down a bit, software. it's their software. And it says, you see, it says it's free. Okay. And it is. Because you can't use it unless you buy their camera. So I don't care if you have the software. It's no good to you if you don't have one of their cameras. And the one you want is the IPVO oh, okay. Vision. All right. Can you click on that? If you click on okay, that, so you clicked on that. Here's free download. Okay, where, I'm point at it for me, Dave. I need everything. Right okay, yeah. See it? A little green. It lights up in green. Okay, right I see it. I see it. Okay, free download. Yeah, okay, click on that, and you pick the one that you need. So I need Mac Windows, old Windows. I need the Mac. Yeah. So click okay. on Mac. The, well, I'll have to show you the Windows because <laughs> it probably okay. won't let me download the Mac. But you just click okay, download yeah, okay. the one you click download for the one you want, uh -huh. and then of course your process will be different than it. Um, do I want to get latest details? No, probably not. <laughs> okay, now okay. it's free, so this goes to the Windows App Store that I just get. All right. In your case, it'll go to the Mac App Store. Let's see. Let's right. see if I can okay. show you what that looks like. Uh, let's try that and see. It's probably going to tell me why do you have got a Mac? You can't do this. There it is. Uh, yeah, it just takes you to the Mac App Store, and then the process okay. is the same for in, for loading any Mac app. Okay. Which I can't really show you because. <laughs> Last time I owned an app, the last time I bought an Apple computer other than a smartphone was 1986. So I've okay. been. <laughs> but anyway, that's how you get that software. All right. And yes, you will need that software. Definitely. Well, no wonder it didn't work. <laughs> you can, you can use this camera with Zoom without that software, but yeah. there's a serious problem, and I'll show you what it is. I can go to my Zoom controller. Let me kill my screen share. Yeah, I can go to my yeah. Zoom controls 
and I under the video menus, I can select that camera. But notice what you see. The camera has a simple lens. So I can't, I'd have to do this. And I'd have to reach around right. from the other side of the camera to write from, right. from over here. So you can do it this way, but it's a pain. Right. So have, having that software makes it so much easier. Yeah, I have a rotate on mine, on my IPVO. Oh, a, a button, a rotate button? I do. That's, you got it's the a, new. Oh, I got sorry, the step got the up board. one, yeah. Remember? Oh, so that might, that might solve that problem. She put out the big bucks, but doesn't know how to use it. <laughs> That's uh, I have like three of them, but they're all old ones. So I'm, one of these days, I'll probably have to buy myself one of the new ones, assuming I could get it. You know, right now, they're so hard to come by. But they do make halfway decent webcams. If you can't buy a webcam, you can use this as a webcam and it doesn't it's not bad and yours is better because you've got one that's got higher resolution capability so you can use it as a webcam yeah. and it's not too bad even though it's not optimized for that and this it's got reasonable uh, it's, it's not really designed to deal with rapid motion but it, it's doing okay so um you could get by with just one camera so you're right pointing right. the light right at your face right now? The light or the, um, or the camera? The, well, so there's a light on my camera, right? <coughs> right. <And> I, <coughs> yes, I have one on my little red light, or red oh. and green lights that show activity. And yes, I'm pointing those right at me. No, I mean, I actually have on my camera a light that I turn on oh, and off. And, oh, right. That's right. That one does come up with a little illuminator. Right. Yeah, you can do that as well. I have a, I have a video light <laughs> in front of mine. <laughs> you, oh, okay. So <laughs> I understand. I, I understand. Thank my you. Cam my camera doesn't have a little <laughs> illuminator on it. It just yeah. has a couple of activity lights on it. But again, mine costs 60 bucks. And I got it probably eight or nine years ago. So, so after I but download the good so thing is it's still working, it's still functional, and yeah, it right. still works with their software and so on. So they they support their products. So after I download this software, do I have to do anything else besides plug my my camera in and nope. Okay. So when you share your screen, down. when you share your screen. Yeah. Um, you'll be able to just bring up the IPVO visualizer software. Okay. There it is. So where and where do I bring that up? Where? Uh, I need you, you'll have an icon in your taskbar probably, That'll or a, an icon on your desktop. It, you know, wherever you, your Mac apps are stored. Okay, all right. I, I haven't even had access to, an app, to a Mac for about three years, so it's getting very dim for me. <laughs> but just the usual way that okay, you- Okay, so I can, set, I can start that up. Yeah. You can start that up after yeah, you share Yeah, I can start that screen. up before I go And then- Oh, um, after. Or before, it doesn't matter. Okay. This camera, I think because I'm sharing my screen, come to think of it, it's not letting me bring it up. Let me kill the screen share for a second and bring that visualizer back up again and see if I can show you. Occasionally this visualizer software with this camera especially gets a little cranky. Uh-huh. If, if lots of other things are going on, like a Zoom meeting and the and a webcam at the same time, another webcam yeah. at the same time. And I think, oh, of course, that's what, I still have it selected as my primary webcam, no wonder. Zoom was locking it up there. There's, now I'm, my Logitech webcam is active. Now, 
if I share my screen and pull up that visualizer, you'll be able to see it, I think. <laughs> Come on. Ah, there it is. It takes it a second. And then I in software now I can do the you could either just punch the button on your camera or you can do the inversion in software like this. And now since I'm sharing my screen, you can see the visual IPVO visualizer window so you can see what the camera is seeing in real time. Okay. You can make this bigger by you know expanding the window the usual way, just dragging the corners to enlarge it. Okay. So you can make it very clear for your students. The the resolution on your camera is quite a bit better than this one's capable of, and this is more than adequate. So whatever you plonk down here, your students are going to be able to see. Whether it's something you're writing on a piece of paper or it's an object, uh, right. smartphone, whatever. And it's, like I said, I don't know how you lecture without, how you lecture in Zoom without this capability. Yeah. It's the missing well, piece no, that is, Zoom doesn't well, you, you use a whiteboard behind you. That's one, one thing I've done. You know? Yeah, but that tends with no, most webcams, it's very hard yeah. to see. It's hard to see, and then, like I told you before, I fell over it. So it's <laughs> <laughs> right. what a, mess. A, a personal risk, right? <laughs> it's a personal oh, risk. <laughs> no, this this is so much better. Because the only way to really make a, and I've tried this for a lot of years, the only way to make a uh, a, wall, a whiteboard hanging on the wall work is to have a camera person filming you who can pan and tilt and zoom uh -oh. um, and and follow what you're doing and focus in on what you're writing right now and so on. In that event, it pr works pretty well, but then you got to have a friend who's willing to, to work <laughs> through your entire lecture. Yeah. So those, those are hard to find. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dave. You bet. Great questions. So Great Dave, if you want to get a camera, what do you recommend? Uh, a document camera? I don't know what? if I want to, I, it, does the document camera just allow you to use it on the desktop? Or um, could you use it if you, if you wanted to do something, have someone hold it and uh, while you did a demo? Oh yeah, yeah, you could do it either way. Okay. And um, the, uh, but for a USB camera like this, that's not primarily a webcam, that's it's designed to show you in full motion and so on, for something that's designed to allow you to show something else happening in the room or show a, a document on a desktop or whatever, I would, these IPVO document cameras are, are the best that I know, and I know they work. And you can get those. Let's see how Amazon's feeling about that today. Though you can get them lots of places online. Oh, they have them right now. This is the one, the, the entry level, the $99 one. There's no need to pay that kind of money for one. Um, yeah, that one's number one bestseller in all of document cameras and is available right now. I don't know what the delivery date is. You know, but uh, I ordered one of those for my son and it delivered two weeks earlier than they said it would. So, oh boy, in stock on April 17th, it says. So yeah, they might get, they might do better. It just depends on what happens. Um, but that's the one I'd get. And you can use that one, like this little one I've got here, you could use it for other things as well. You could do just what you described, um, which is to um, 
focus on something, somebody doing a demonstration or something like that. And all you'd have to do would be, let me kill the screen share here. Uh, actually, just before I cut that off, you saw that the, yeah, the you tilted head up. swivels and so on. Okay. Um, but, and so does the one I've got. But if I make that my primary document camera now, start the video. Oh, sorry, I have to close that, that application like, before I can do that. that. The photo you have up looks like Durer's self-portrait when he is trying to be Christ. <laughs> I've heard a lot of things, been compared to a lot of things, but not Christ. <laughs> okay, now this one you can just pick up and you can move it around the room and show. There's my camera set up behind me and my light and my messy studio and so on. You can just do this, you can show anything you like. And it also works pretty well with the green screen as well which is a little surprising, okay. but you know, I can just, and for a document, to have something that can function both as a document camera and a webcam, that's the best solution, but you can also do something like this. So let me go back to my regular cam and, um, Oh, do I have that sitting here? No, I have a picture of it somewhere. Ah, oh, d d d d d d d d. Search for Zoom. This is our on-demand site again? Let me find the one I'm looking for. We have four pages of tutorials on Zoom here, and we've been doing this for a long time. Ah. Take a look at this one. I don't know if you can see that, but that's a regular webcam, a Logitech C920. And I've got it mounted. It has, it has a little tripod mount on the bottom of it. You can mount it on a tripod and you can pan it around the room or zoom and tilt or tilt and pan around the room. Um, so you can use it like a little camcorder almost, or a, a video What's camera. The same brand? Uh, no, this is a Logitech C920 series, and those I think are out of stock on um, Amazon. So let's see if anybody has them right now. I just specify this model because I know it has the tripod mount mm -hmm. uh, and not all of them do. Logitech C920 Pro HD webcam, that's the one we'd like. Um, well, Adorama, which I think I did do business with one time, has it for not a terrible price. Here's some place named Connection never heard of them you always wonder that's the one this is not exactly Amazon I, I this site looks familiar I think I bought some of uh, I think I bought that video camera I have from them one time and I got away with it but, so about what should the price be on that about uh that's not unreasonable it, before all this started, I, it was probably... I can just see you. I'm sorry? I can only see you. Oh, gosh, I'm not sharing my screen. Excuse me. I forgot. Let me take care of that. There we go. Uh, here's the... This company. It's 90 bucks here. It was about 70 bucks before all this started. I, I've seen it between 70 and 80. I think I paid 70 for the one I have years ago. So that's not a totally unreasonable price. No, that but doesn't bother me at all. I, I can't vouch for these people. I, I, uh, if you buy from them, be sure to use a credit card where you sure the people will stand up. If they don't deliver, you can cancel the order and so on and not pay them. I, I think they're okay. 
And what's I, I, I know I've looked, I know I've different. bought something from them before. I don't remember what it was. Now some of the others though, um, eBay is always a risk. These others I don't know at all. Um, Let's see, Walmart. Oh, let's see if Walmart has it. Walmart I'd buy from. Get in stock alert. That's out of, out of stock right now. For 30 bucks, that, that's a really good price. List is, yeah, 80 bucks. But I don't think you'll ever see it at that price point again. Um, from Dell? Certainly somebody. Oh, Dell has them for 80 bucks. Okay. And that's a that's a very reasonable price for this webcam. Not the greatest price I've ever seen, but it's reasonable. And Dell is certainly reputable to order from. So I'd order from them if I were gonna order. Okay. And it looks like a view delivery date. So let's see if this <laughs> let's check the fine print. Uh uh. What's your zip code? Nine two one zero three. July. <laughs> That's not July. So afraid of that. So. Okay, I, well, I can know. check it out. Yeah, you can check it out. That that's the model I would recommend. Okay. Because, uh, or there's actually several different 920s. There's a 920S and a 920X. The S is actually cheaper than this, and the X is way more. It's like lists for like $200. The, nine, the basic 920 is all you, or the 920S would be fine, but I haven't been able to find those lately either. But that, that IPVO, though, would work. For both, you could use it as a document camera and as a webcam for uh, your normal Zoom meetings and as a, a, a camera to uh, film something else going on in the room with you. Okay. And all for one price, one camera. So I'd be tempted just to use that because it's got a lot better resolution than the one that I'm than the IPVO that I'm using here. Okay. <laughs> it, in fact, is, it has can do 4k okay. uh, which is good luck with having the bandwidth to support that but it, the camera is capable of of getting as sharp as you like so i'd be strongly tempted just to get that one i'm i'm more than half tempted to go ahead and order a new one even though i've got three old ones that are still working fine I got a feeling getting that past the wife is going to be a little challenging, though. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Dave. I'm taking yes, off. thank you. Cynthia. Oh, it's so great to talk to you all. all and right. I'll see you again soon, I hope. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, Kathy. Bye-bye. Bye, Cynthia. Stay safe. You too. You bet.